the things that I have done that turned out well started with those attributes. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be part of all this. Um, the stickiest part of all this is that it, uh, it touches the root zone, which is, in some ways is the um, third rail of internet politics, uh, like in a subway system. It's where the electricity is. If you touch it, you die. Um, and so there's been a lot of people who have been afraid that this is uh, somehow an attempt to capture the, uh, the, the root zone, and that's absolutely furthest from the truth. Um, I have been a one namespace guy since uh, the earliest days when I started tinkering with all this. So uh, there, there will not be an alternate namespace that comes out of this effort uh, unless I have first resigned in protest. So if, it, if that's what you came here to worry about, then uh, let, me, let me put your mind at rest. Um, otherwise, we're late. The project is behind schedule. We took about a year getting our various uh, infrastructure systems put together to the point where we could even do any kind of science. Um, so we have done some science, uh, and Shane will be talking about that, and I'm proud of every result we have produced. Um, we have more to do. At the moment, the project is scheduled to end on uh, December 31st of 2018. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the chances are it will be extended or morphed into something at that time. But um, at the moment, we are marching to that schedule with the intent of learning everything we can and then turning it off on that day, unless the participants want to do something else with the infrastructure that was created. <coughs> so um, I'm very proud of my fellow coordinators. Uh, uh, they, they are also busy with a lot of other things in their day jobs and their families. And uh, you know, the, when you when you have a project that's got people in Asia and people in the U.S., it's almost always going to be after midnight for somebody on a con call. Um, I often have it be me because the other two coordinators are in Beijing and Tokyo, respectively, and I don't want to make them have to uh, have to stay up late, but they have. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> um, unfortunately, there is no Korean participants. <laughs> so um, this is Akira Kato from White Project Tokyo, and the, one of the coordinators. Um, the, I'm very sorry that I asked Paul to join the conference call in his midnight <laughs> um, a couple of weeks, uh, the, uh, every other week. Is. But um, the, this is wow. Well, this is the, uh, the very important uh, opportunity for us to test the uh, routine sub because uh, the server side, I think it's okay because uh, the number of implementation are not uh, great. But unfortunately, the number of the middle boxes like a CP mm -hmm. devices and security devices, we don't have a reach to developers. So that could affect the operation of the DNS, especially on the IPv6 age. So if you guys have the reach to those developers, please uh, tell the ET uh, is working on and participate if possible. So thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, we have a uh, the Kara people, uh, friend, <laughs> and uh, I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> and uh, and uh, transmission or conference, and uh, I'm going to be here. And uh, last week we began in uh, India to attend the ICANN meeting. So, uh, especially the the long way to uh, uh, the experts attend this uh, DNS conference workshop. And I would like to thank you uh, for your attention and your time. So the internet is booming uh, uh, across the world, but it, especially in such a region, the Asia Pacific, and that's the largest number of citizens. Internet changed my 
our lives. So we are very honored to be together to discuss, to employ the internet in the future. In, uh, in, in future. Thank you for everyone and uh, your job and commitment over the past years. And uh, one year ago, in order to the impress the internet, uh, we joined the announcement package, the Yeti project, as the global project, as the startup, uh, and started to the build the global, the first IPv6 only road server testbed. We hope uh, we can uh, improve and uh, make the contribution to the internet and uh, make the better internet and a better world. So IPv6 is very important and is the key of the sustainable mm -hmm. development and the scalability of the internet. Over the past years, we can see the IPv6 traffic is over 10% uh, worldwide. Established, uh, I'm back uh, the, the Indian IK meeting, and uh, which is uh, impressed me a lot of. The minister of the India and uh, the Tony, and uh, in the past uh, just one years, and the India so the IPv6 traffic has a increasing from 1% to 10%. And uh, with uh, nearly the 50 million IPv6 users, and the India will be soon become the largest region in action of IPv6 users, maybe next year. In past years, we have uh, worked closely with each other, not only having addressed the many technical problems, but all comes the difficult case by the different language, different regions. One year later, we have published uh, distribute uh, the road server network and uh, 25 server and 60 operators. And we have a different model to show the capacity and the possibility of the uh, research of future uh, road systems. Over the past years, uh, we had the support from the community as well as uh, some questions and problems that we have uh, distributed and focused on the technical work and to make the process. We will continue to support the more the innovations, activities in Yeti and the uh, introduction of more the IPv6 traffic and the users to the testbed. So BI has been the focusing on the internet infrastructure for over the 16 years. I personally joined this work related to China and the world internet a long term ago. We are established and we will continue to support the platform of the interoperability and innovate it to promote IPv6 in S, SDN and IoT. And I'm honored that the BI can make the contribution to the internet in such a way to connect people in the community. Finally, uh, I would like special uh, thanks and uh, with our, our partner coordinator, Dr. Paul Griggs and Dr. Akila Kato and all the attendees. Dear friends, again, thank you for your being here and hope you keep an open the mind and through the, the discussion. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you for all the questions and uh, So let's go into the first. Uh, before the uh, keynote speech, I would like to say that, uh, yeah, it's not, not a easy work for us, actually. <laughs> We, uh, especially the language, the different time zone, and we work for more than one year. Sometimes we lack of uh, peoples, and uh, and all of us have our own business to do. So uh, we hope we can enjoy the time, especially face to face discuss. Um, it only have, it, we only hold uh, once every year to meet uh, 
uh, in, in, in this scare uh, meeting. So yeah, please. Uh, any any questions or any uh, proposals can you can interrupt interrupt uh, and raise your hand. Okay, let's first go to the uh, the, the keynote speech. Welcome, Paul Vision. I think so. So calling this a keynote is a little overblown, but um, I almost always have something to say. And yeah, that's the one. Is there a full screen mode? Yeah, there we go. Um, so we've been tinkering with the infrastructure of how to make this project work um, for quite a while. That's why it started late. And uh, there have been some lessons learned. Some of those lessons are applicable to the remainder of this project, and some might be applicable beyond this project. Um, so I will uh, run through this as briefly as I can, leaving room for questions, which is really the reason I'm here, is for, to interact. I, I could talk to you all on, an, on a mailing list and not be able to hear you, but then coming here, flying this far so that we can talk and also so that you can listen. So first, we have used Git in a, a way that I think is interesting and odd. Um, the specifications of Git, the capabilities that we all knew it had, said that it could be used in this way, so we uh, chose this to solve a certain problem. Um, and it ultimately did work, but not without some delay and some, uh, some pain. So the problem we had is that we have three coordinators who are peers. Uh, there is no one in charge of this project. Um, the, the leadership occurs by consensus. I have it right here. Yeah. Okay. This web broadcast. Oh, web broadcast. <laughs> People can see you and hear you. All right. So um, we all need to be able to edit the metadata that describes the project, the list of participants. Uh, and we did not want to assign one of us the role of uh, some kind of super coordinator who would then handle edit requests from the other two. Uh, because as I mentioned in my prior remarks, the root name service, the root zone is uh, very uh, dangerous in internet politics. It is something where if you walk too close to it, the radiation might kill you. And if you look at it the wrong way, then onlookers might think that you're trying to steal it. So um, we, we had to make sure that there was no distinctive role for any of the coordinators. Um, so we created a Git repo that has some odd characteristics. Um, so first we had to create a, uh, a user ID for the various Linux and BSD systems that we're going to participate, and we chose GiddyConf. Um, we created that, uh, that account on three servers and gave it SSH access to the other two servers uh, through the um, authorized keys file. So in other words, there's a key pair for each of the Yeti, Yeti Conf users in the three projects. And any of us can have uh, get access to the other repos. Um, I have two repos on my particular uh, distribution master. Uh, one I use for reading, and it is accessed through the file system. Because when you access Git through the file system, it does not prompt you for the, uh, the, the, the secret to, the, uh, to your SSH key. In other words, if it's there and it's readable according to Unix file permissions, then you can just get access to it. Um, but uh, when I am pushing new uh, key material or other changes to the rest of the project, uh, I have a separate repo, uh, which you can see on this slide, has got uh, three push remotes and one fetch remote. Uh, now, the choice of the fetch remote was interesting and might have political implications, so let me just say, um, I am not funded through my day job to work on this. This is something that I do unreliably 
uh, when everyone else in my house is asleep and when there's nothing more pressing. Uh, so I am not a reliable party when it comes to giving me fixed duties. Uh, Kato is better, but he also has a day job and this is not it. Whereas the people at BII are actually doing this as part of a, uh, a, a normal day job activity. Their participation is more reliable because if they don't do Yeti, then they probably don't get paid or something like that. So the result is most edits come from them. Um, doesn't mean that they have a distinguished position as far as the ability to edit, but it means that if I uh, fetch from anywhere else, then I will be a little bit later. Uh, so I always fetch from them simply because that gives me the lowest latency because that's where most of the changes enter the system. Um, anyway, this works. It just means that you have to do a get pull uh, in the second repo shown here at the three push uh, origins. Uh, you have to do that and then edit what you want to edit and then get it committed and pushed before anyone else makes a change because you, you can only push if you are up to date. Um, and uh, anyway, this is working. It took some time to get working. Uh, you know, it seemed like a good idea, but then the devil was in the details because Git doesn't really help you set it up this way. You have to use a lot of commands that are unusual to make this go. So I want to say that because you can only have one person effectively editing at a time. They won't be able to push their changes if the repo they're pushing toward has changed since they synchronized against it. This could not be used for a high update rate. In other words, this works at the moment. We hardly ever have a conflict because the rate of changes is about one per week. If we were trying to do this once per hour, I would expect an occasional conflict. If we tried to do this once a minute, I would expect constant conflicts. So uh, this works for us, but it is not going to scale. It's not something that has um, taught us anything about how other peer organizations could share data of this kind. Um, it also would not support a larger set of project members. Three works, five would probably work, 10 would start to fail horribly. Uh, because there would always be one you couldn't push to because they would currently be behind some BGP black hole that was uh, you know, ill-timed from your point of view, but inevitable from the Internet's point of view. This was hard to set up. We probably ought to document, you know, do a clean room, start from scratch on this, and uh, show command by command exactly what we had to do, because if you want to do this, um, you will have to learn what we learned, but we don't know what we learned because we didn't write it down after we got it working. Um, it is hard to verify that it is working. It's hard to monitor uh, with any kind of automation. And if it's broken, it's hard to debug. So in other words, this fails every test of good engineering. Um, you can't even uh, break it in a way that requires that you send email and then wait for somebody else to wake up before it's, it's working again, so it makes it very fragile. Uh, there is no protection for the KSK that we're using or any of the ZSKs we're using. Uh, in other words, they're just sitting there in clear text in this repo. If you have access to the system where the repo is stored, you can read the private and public sides of what should be sensitive material. Um, that is poor security, it is adequate for science, I think it's adequate for small enterprise use where the total cost of having somebody read your key is relatively low, but you would never do this with, at an internet production level. This is, uh, there's a reason why I can rent bunkers and send everybody down to where the HSM is when they want to make key stuff, and that's that uh, it's important and the, the cost of, of losing that material uh, would be extremely high, uh, almost irrecoverable, in fact. Um, right, so let's move on. There is a t-shirt around that says, how about it? let's just put it in DNS. Uh, but in this case, we're not putting it in DNS, we stuck it all in cron. This is what the cron job looks like for the uh, uh, YetiConf user that, um, that is on my particular DM. The DMs, the distribution masters, are, uh, are the things that the three coordinators run. So uh, there are three DMs, one, one per coordinator. 
so as you can see, all I'm doing is uh, changing the directory to someplace, and if that's possible, then I execute the cron run often script. Um, this is a fairly portable way to use cron. In fact, almost every use of cron since the earliest days when I used it for NetNews and UUCP all looked like that. The difference is uh, we all have to fetch the uh, ionozone and we all have to do various things. We strip off the, those keys, we strip off those NS records and so on. And uh, we don't want to be doing that at the same time um, because when we, when each of our three peer distribution masters uh, has done that, we're going to start publishing a new copy of the root zone uh, and we're going to pass the INS serial number through and that'll mean that we send notifies and all three of us are configured to send notifies to all of the public uh, secondary servers. Um, and we don't want it to be that people are getting notifies from more than one of us at a time. Um, so uh, we divided the clock into three parts. One of the coordinators runs zero minutes after each hour, one is 20 minutes after each hour, and one is 40. Uh, by this, I can tell that I am the 40. That doesn't mean that uh, one of us always wins because IANA doesn't always pick the same minute after the hour to release a new serial number, and FROOT, where I fetch it from, also does not always pick the same minute after the hour. So sometimes I'm the one sending notifies that are effective because people fetch the zone from me, and sometimes it's Kato, and sometimes it's Davy. Uh, but we don't care. That doesn't matter because we're all doing the same transform, we're all starting from the same data. Um, and of course, most hours, uh, IANA hasn't done anything. Um, in fact, some IANA changes are just changes to the um, signatures because they resign from time to time, even if none of the TLDs has asked for an NS record update. So, um, uh, mostly this just wastes a lot of bandwidth by fetching the root zone from FROOT. Uh, every hour, even though it only changes, uh, you know, probably one hour out of 24, or sometimes one hour out of 72. Um, so this cron run script is set up the way all cron scripts are now set up, uh, which is that it only produces output if something happened. So silence means there's nothing to say. So here are the comments out of that file. You see that I'm fetching it from fruit. I picked fruit because I used to be on the fruit team. I suppose I should pick root now. Um, and we fetched the YAML config from the YetiConf Git repo. And I'll show you what that YAML looks like. Um, then we remake the con config include file, which contains some allow transfer and also notify statements, which then tell my distribution master who is allowed to fetch the zone from me. I'm not sure why I care, why I don't just let it be completely open access, because it's open access once it gets to the, the publication uh, secondaries. Um, but in any case, we have uh, we have it in here. Um, and we also have the also notify, because of course we're sending notification to a lot of servers, none of whom are listed in the NS record set. Right? Uh, the, the ones that are listed in the NS record set by, are, are, in this case, um, yeah, we're, those are the addresses by which they are externally accessed by their customers, and sometimes they don't accept notify on those addresses. Um, so then we create the Yeti-based zone file based on the IANA zone file, and I want to point out it's always the same namespace. We do not add or delete any NS records. Uh, that is an article of hard faith for all of us. Uh, but we do have to replace the NS record set in order that people will send queries to this if they are otherwise subscribed to it. And because we're changing the NS records, we can't, uh, uh, we, we have to re-sign it with our own keys because the IANA signatures that came to us will be invalidated by the fact that we uh, uh, changed the NS record set. So the only reason we have our own keys is because we have our own NS records. Uh, but in any case, that will be the only change that you see. Um, modulo, some interesting experiments. I know that uh, we are using a larger key uh, than other 
than the IANA system uses, and I think we are planning on exploring different uh, signing algorithms. Um, and what else are we doing? Um, not sure, but uh, there is some chance we'll put the glue records, we'll add the glue records uh, as a pseudo domain. So we'll put them under under bar Yeti or something like that. So it will look like we have just created an under bar Yeti TLD, but there won't be an NS record there. It's just, it will just be a placeholder for some quad A records. And again, that, uh, that would be an example of a change we would not make without first talking to the entire Yeti community and making sure that nobody had heartburn over it because that is technically speaking a change to the namespace. So at the very end of this file, there's this if statement that just runs the bind nine signer. Um, I do not use the bind nine signer's ability to uh, change to a directory full of keys and then access whatever keys are needed based on you know what, what it sees in the zone. Uh, I explicitly determine which keys I want to sign with, um, and then you can see I'm dumping the output and the errors into a dot out file. Uh, if the sign zone completes successfully, then I send the reload command to my DM. Um, and I am, in this case, doing a grep minus V. That means show me all records that don't contain this pattern, uh, because otherwise I end up seeing a lot of reloads for things that didn't change, and uh, that's useless to me. So um, basically, it has to have something else to tell me, uh, or I am not going to. Uh, uh, not going to produce that output. And then if the, uh, if the signer fails, we look at the reason, we cat it, which causes it to get mailed to the owner of this crown tab, which is in this case me, uh, and then we, we die right here. So this is tried and true stuff. If, you, uh, if you've been using Unix and cron jobs since 1985, you've been looking at this in all of your R news and uh, the R mail, very uh, Chrome jobs. This is a small excerpt from the YAML file. For each public secondary, there is a stanza that indicates what is the name that goes for the NS record for them. First one is Gerard Damas, and the second one is our friends at the Russian Internet Exchange, Moscow Internet Exchange. Um, and you can see that uh, Joao just has a public IP and doesn't need anything else. So we notify that IP, uh, he transfers from that IP and so forth. Whereas the folks in Moscow uh, said, well, here's the service address, but if you're gonna send us notifies, you gotta use these other addresses. And when we transfer from you, we're also gonna be using those other addresses. And that's fine. Um, it, uh, Basically, you can see that the public IP repeats for the Moscow Internet Exchange inside the notifying transfer sets. Uh, but you know, it doesn't matter to us. Just tell us what you need so that we will put the right stuff in our config files, and uh, you know, it should be you know, relatively non-controversial. So this is what that turns into. There is the predictable, predictable Perl script that sucks in that YAML file and um, produces this conclude. Uh, so I didn't include the rest of it, but you can see that basically it just puts things into various parts of the uh, conf include based on what was in the YAML. And again, this is uh, really bone simple uh, once you look at the Perl code, which I'm not going to show you today because uh, we just ate. Um, so here are my lessons at the moment. Uh, we, we had a successful experiment where each DM uses its own zone sending key. So this is gonna be uh, deliberately different from the way IANA does it. Uh, there are at every apex that is DNSX signed gonna be at least two keys. It doesn't have to be two, but it tends to be two. Um, one will be the thing that generates the SIGs for the zone content, and one will be the thing that just generates a SIG for that other key. And this gives you a two-layer hierarchy so that your key signing key can be changed much less frequently than your zone signing key. Uh, but we decided since we had three different distribution masters that were peers, uh, what if they each used their own zone signing key? Um, and uh, the signatures that you got when you queried this system would end up having been generated by some different zone signing key every time. 
it all depends on sort of who you got to notify from or who you fetched from. Uh, would that break anything? And it really doesn't because uh, the zone signing keys, all of the zone signing keys, but I, I might add, have to be signed with the key signing key. And that key signing key is the thing that you've got in your trusted keys file on your name, on your recursive name server if you subscribe to this. Uh, so we basically stuck a funny curly queue into the trust graph just to see what would happen. And it turns out nothing happened. Uh, we've tested every validator we know of. None of them is, uh, it gets, it is full of complaints about the way we did this. As a result, we decided that NZSK, the multiple zone signing key thing, would remain. Uh, had the experiment turned up that uh, maybe some validators hate this, we would have taken it out and the experiment would be over. But now this is a permanent part of the, of the architecture until we decide that we want to do some other experiment that counts on it not being there. So that's working. However, um, I at least need to automate the creation of these zone signing keys because um, you know, at the moment, if my script can't find one that covers the current date, uh, it just dies. And then my DM goes offline and stops sending notifies. And it's, it's, uh, it's embarrassing, but um, it's also an interesting uh, way of showing that actually one third of us could be broken, probably two thirds of us could be broken and the system would still work. So in terms of showing that a peer arrangement like this it uh, gives you a little bit more resiliency in case somebody slips on a banana peel and doesn't generate their zone keys. Uh, that, that part worked. That's not a finding because we can't uh, reproduce it exactly, but it's, it, it is true. Um, leaving these KSKs and MZSKs unencrypted at rest is irresponsible. I realize this is just science and we don't care who had a copy of them, but we ought to prove that it is at least possible to secure them in this way or we haven't demonstrated anything with regard to the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, distribution master model. Um, of course, anytime you decide you're going to crypt and sign things, you create an immense key management hassle for yourself and a whole bunch of other things that can go wrong. And, and um, so given how fragile the system is right now, I'm in no hurry to, to uh, crypt or sign anything, but that is something that should be on a to-do list if there was a to-do list. Um, at the moment, when we want to uh, rotate the KSK, uh, we do it very carefully, and we have a lot of people look in the second set of eyes. This is the set of parameters I intend to use that will cause the new key to be signed by the old key and reachable during an overlap period and so on. Um, I don't think that it's actually rocket science. I have a feeling that that could be a cron job um, or a series of cron jobs, but um, we, we're not there yet right now. That's all done by hand. Um, this code is not horrible, and I've written some horrible Perl code, and some of you have seen that, so uh, you should understand that this is not the worst you've seen. Um, but nevertheless, it ought to be seen by somebody other than me. Um, and I think that publishing it might be the uh, right thinking thing to do. Uh, a lot of people are happy to, when they get to find and expose a bug in other people's code, so I should probably tap into that. Um, so this could be used in very limited local production, and I'll be explaining more about what I mean about that at the end of the day. Uh, but I'm just saying that at the moment, if you wanted to create a locally signed root zone, um, you could. We've proven that that is possible. Uh, I would not recommend doing it in a way that anybody outside your laptop or maybe outside your house was going to see it, but nevertheless, it would work. Um, uh, Perl, you know, keeps on chugging. After all these years, it is still working. The NetDNS module was exactly what I needed for this, and that's why that particular Perl script is pretty clean. I realize that there's a Python DNS module and a Go DNS module and so forth, so I'm not saying Perl's the only thing, but it tends to be my first choice, and in this case, my first choice required no compromises. The code just worked. Uh, the ISC Bind 9 server uh, is working perfectly for this. And all of its utilities, signing zones, verifying zones, that kind of thing, are working perfectly. So um, I realize that there are this OpenDNSSEC and there's LDNS, there's a whole bunch of other tool sets. And I believe that Kato is using some of those. Um, and they also work. I'm just saying that ISC by 9 has uh, not 
thrown any roadblocks for me. And finally, the Born Shell is still the right way to write your outer uh, layer for this. Uh, it is kind of like the IBM JCL of its era, where if you can look at that and debug that, then you know at, at the, the highest outermost layer of your application what it's doing and what it would do differently under different failure conditions and so forth. So uh, I, I think I made the right choice there. And uh, that's all I'm going to say today, or for, for now, um, modulo questions. I see a number of people struggling to stay awake. Uh, it's not my speaking style. But um, I would like to hear any questions or complaints about any of this. David, can I have the microphone? Ah. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to add one, one minor note is that it all sounds a bit grim and undocumented, which parts of it are, but the basic mechanisms here are all documented in Markdown on our GitHub site. So we do have the, the full algorithm involved for, for producing the zone files and for publishing them, what times things are running, everything like that. So uh, we don't have a how-to. You're, you're completely correct about that. Setting up the Git is, it does require a bit of magical knowledge. But if you're a Git guru, presumably you could read, read the documentation and then automatically know. But um, yeah, that, that's about it. So, okay, thank you, thank you Shaman brings up the point that uh, we agreed on how this was going to work and how we were each going to cooperate, but then we each went off and wrote our own code. Um, so I uh, took some of Kato's code for key generation because uh, he was able to fight through how all that stuff worked in a way that made it very clear to me. Uh, but as, other than that, I believe that every scrap of code on the 3DMs is completely unique as to how it implements this. Uh, and that was deliberate. We wanted some diversity there. We wanted to prove that we could have multiple interoperable implementations in the style of IETF. I, I have a question. Give that man a microphone. Yeah. Do you roll the cascade and how often do you roll it? Uh, we have rolled it once. Yes. Uh, it didn't work very well. Um, we're planning to roll it again. Twice? Uh, we've I done think. It twice. Yeah, I will introduce in my flies. Uh, the first okay. try, ignore the 15 level <laughs> settings. Okay. So just try. Um, yes, we're, we, we want to make sure that uh, KSK roll works. And one of our uh, sort of project outline points was that we could roll the ZSK every week if we wanted to, uh, which would maybe give us a little bit better demonstration of whether everybody was ready for RFC 5011 as compared to when IANA does it, um, we are all going to be holding our breath to see if everybody can do it. But since this is a non-production test bed where most of the traffic is being mirrored from other sources, if we get it wrong, it doesn't really break anything. So we're planning on rolling the key very often once we get it a little bit better automated. That looks like it for me. Thank, Thank you. you. implementation of software. Louder, please. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, according to Jim, the next one is uh, invited talk from uh, Nanchi. Thank you. I will help to do uh, to it. Do you want to? Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, I already enjoyed this workshop a lot. The you know the keynote speaker 
start, the first slide of the keynote speaker was a git with git commands. <laughs> <laughs> this is a keynote. <laughs> Uh, moreover, uh, the last slide says, Pearl is not dead. <laughs> For gray hair like me and others in the room, you know, this is good news. Uh, speaking of myself, I actually leapfrog from Pearl to Darkly to Swift, so it's kind of... <laughs> I pass over Python. Uh, uh, however, I do disagree with uh, Paul that I highly prefer Seashell, but this is one is pretty dead. Badly. Seashell is dead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I always have to install because it's never uh, by default in you know, standard distribution except FreeBSD. Um, a warning about this uh, presentation, this is about internalization, so, you know, this is the ugly stuff you can think about that you know, always work and kind of not always work. Um, so um, the purpose here is to give you kind of a top down, but you know, some technical, but not as good, but uh, some technical about uh, what's going on about IDN and markets. Um, and to give you a perspective on actually, you know, uh, what you know, could happen uh, in the near future about the root zone and uh, the DNS in general. So uh, the context of this is that uh, you know DNS does very strictly that far and I think this is great, but human lang humans are using languages and scripts that are doing fuzzy things. So the key point here is how can we reconcile them together? We'll see if we succeed. Um, Current available toolkit to do this, uh, to do this, uh, you know, reconciliation is DNS, IDNA, and OGR, and we'll speak essentially the third part, but you know, start with the, the first two. So, what do we have in DNS for for you know, doing kind of mappings? We have D D name, which is a redirection of the tree. What is it initially defined for IPv6, but it doesn't fit exactly what we want. However, this is an advertisement. I'm not involved in the buff, but I would highly suggest if you're interested in this that there's a DNS bundle buff this week that touches this problem. So I would highly invite you to attend that meeting, that buff. IDNA con is, consists of a few, a few things. One is, you know, uh, Finicode encoding, which is essentially encodes UTF-8 into restricted X key for DNS purposes. So in your zone file, there's no UTF-8, but instead where the labels that start with XN dash dash and then you know, X, X stuff. Um, uh, IDNA 2003 uh, was the first uh, variation of, uh, of how to encode, uh, to do IDNs. Uh, and essentially IDNA 2003 uh, essentially lists uh, the code points that were valid, roughly speaking. Um, that has the consequence that every time there is a new Unicode uh, version uh, released, then you somewhat have to touch the the, uh, the, the specs and then add the font and then you know, do the code points analysis and uh, review uh, the new version of the release a new version of the spec. That uh, is kind of a you know, lot of work. So. For other reasons also, uh, IDNA 2008 came in, and instead is based on Unicode properties of the code points, which defines uh, if a code point is valid, as some, some kind of context rules, basic context rules. And uh, in, you know, in the field, uh, when people talk about IDN, we often say p-valid, because that means protocol valid, which is a code point that you can use. When a new release of Unicode, a new table of code points is computed automatically uh, and then published to the IANA website so you can fetch it and then you have the valid code points that you've been used in the DNS in using IDN in 2008 for each uh, Unicode releases. Therefore, it should be no issue, right? <laughs> um, sadly for some people and users, there is no symbols and emoji uh, in IDNA, <laughs> uh, given the, the, my 
teenagers, uh, children, uh, this is really sad. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> so only for 2008, 2003 actually permitted. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, this was Andrew Sullivan, <laughs> which I will uh, refer to in a few minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Um, IDNA tables. Um, so to continue what uh, Andrew said, when we wrote uh, IDNA 2003, I was you know, co-chair and also you know, wrote some of the wrong specs. And uh, so what we said, she, there was a paragraph that says, Everything in the future should should be somewhat included in symbol. Therefore, you know, everything coming in was kind of you know, okay. So that's where it comes from. Um, IDNA tables. Um, so uh, IDNA 2003 started to be deployed and used uh, during the uh, IDN first working group in the early 2000. Um, there were some registries. So remember, this was still in the uh, late of the bubble phase, and there were some registries, uh, the well-known registries, that wanted to duplicate by 10 the number of labels and uh, domains they would sell. <laughs> so there was a big push to deploy this uh, RFC as soon as possible so that they could sell 10 times the number of domains. So, you know, that, that was a gold mine, uh, gold rush. Um, so uh, registries uh, for second level domains Names have to define which scripts and characters they support because uh, you know, supporting everything is, is pretty complex. So they, uh, for various reasons, but uh, I'm not going into the details, they define IDN tables. So uh, essentially, th there was a few format specification, but no standard one. Uh, so it was almost impossible to process automatically. Uh, so it was essentially for documentation purposes, and they are still being used. Therefore. Each uh, GTLD under ICANN was asked to uh, put their IDN tables into this registry, and each CCTLD may want to publish their IDN tables in their, this registry, but uh, obviously no, 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 no matter. There was no real compatibility between the IDN tables, so for a given language or script, a code point may be valid for in one TLD and invalid in another. By the way, this is okay in a sense that each registry can define its own uh, language table, uh, but that just shows uh, you know the complex the complexity of this. And the variant support uh, we'll talk about variant later. Uh, variant support was pretty variable. <coughs> so what is a variant? Um, <laughs> there are many definitions of it, and that's that's one of the problems we have. Um, a an example a possible variant in my own language French is a, fo a followed by e. It can be written as a sequence of A and E, or the ligature AE, which is a single code point. The last one is a single code point. So that's an example of a possible variant. I'm saying this because possible because uh, you will see later that uh, uh, the different script communities are, are defining the, uh, the, the, uh, the tables, which are called LGRs, and the Latin script uh, generation panel hasn't been uh, finish his work, so therefore this is a possible mapping. Uh, we'll see if this uh, becomes, or not, the solution, uh, the possible uh, variant. So I can set up a committee to identify how to support variants in the root zone. The recommendations are here, and uh, the text says what is a variant. There's today no fully accepted variant definition of what may constitute the variant relationship between top level labels and the results of the case studies. Uh, suggest there were many case studies on different uh, scripts, suggest that it would be very difficult to come to a single conclusion at the current time because there is no more than one phenomenon being discussed. <laughs> I'm pointing to the <coughs> person uh, before who, uh, who, uh, who uh, made a comment uh, and who was uh, the main author, I guess, or main editor of this uh, document. So I'll show you some definitions of variance uh, as you go. So, uh, again, tables, IDN tables, no standard format. Uh, so, one of the recommendations of the committee was to uh, generate uh, what is called now label generation rules, which is uh, how to correctly support uh, IDN. It, the label generation rules is, uh, are there to define how to correctly support IDNs, and it's essentially a domain specific language that you encode, where you encode the rules of each writing system. 
Uh, there's also a procedure to define them. And the LGR themselves are not using DNS, this is key. Uh, uh, you, they are used at registration time to identify if a specific label is valid, its variance, and the validity of its variance. So the LGR is a way to define a repertoire, so a list of code points or a sequence of code points, relationship between code points, uh, variant mappings, rules to be applied to those code points, and rules to be applied to the old, uh, lab old label. LGR may be defined for languages and or scripts, and has the potential to be used in other domains than, than DNS, for example, linguistic purposes. Could you, could you give an example of the rules? Yes, that's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, LGR specification, initially defined by Kim Davies of uh, IANA. Uh, it's been uh, uh, looked and standardized in the library working group, so we drank a lot of beer. Uh, RFC is 7940, it's in, based on XML. And next slide will show a, a glimpse of uh, what you could do with the LGR specification. Uh, these examples are taken from real submitted LGR of various scripts, so this is not made uh, in a basic example, it's actually mine. Uh, actually submitted uh, from various scripts. I wanted to use a single script, then use all the, and walk you through the single script with all the examples, but I didn't find one which you know worked for all examples, so it's kind of a mix of the different uh, GRs. So this is a uh, so the first part of the uh, LGR specification is just uh, meta data, um, nothing big here. Uh, language tag here is actually to define uh, the language and or or the script that is uh, is defined in this LGR file. You could use many of them, uh, you know, all together. So you can define multiple language or multiple scripts in a single LGR if you want. Um, the scope here is uh, to which scope uh, the uh, LGR is applied. So here is an example of the root zone, therefore the duct. If if I want to apply this LGR to um, I don't know dot ca, I would say ca dot as the scope. So this is the scope of the LGR to be applied to. Dot .ca, right? Therefore, you can have all kind of file, LGR files together that defines not only the root, but also all the, you know, all the uh, second level or third or whatever. And it applies to domain type equal domain. So for example, if later on it's used for linguistic purposes, it will define new type. You have references and description and basic stuff. Now we are getting into code. <laughs> Um, so this is an example of a repertoire. So as I said, the first task of a LGR is uh, defining the repertoire, the code points. So this is for Armenian, and uh, this is the code point uh, 0586, uh, that's the Unicode uh, number. Uh, Unicode code point, uh, I don't know, is there any laser? Or... Sorry. I don't know, someone, someone has a laser. <laughs> so this is the actual book. <laughs> <laughs> pointer. <laughs> so at the end of this line here, there's the, the code point. Uh, the tag identifies a set of code points. Oh, wow. thank, thank you very you. much. Ah, ah. that's good. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this is the code point, and you can. Uh, these are uh, references to references. So it's for documentation purposes because you want the LGR to be fully documented in a sense that. It, uh, you could, someone else could review the LGR and see that uh, here's a proof that this code point actually belongs to Armenian or to, you know, Arabic or something. This next one here defines a range, so from one Unicode code point to another one, so it could be, you know, 1,000 different code points in just a single one. Given that Unicode has uh, claims where uh, scripts are defined in a, you know, kind of sequence, often you can use a range because they are all, you know, one after the other for a single script. Or you can define a, a code point sequence. So this is, a, again, my, my example of A and E as two, uh, code, uh, two code points. So that's a sequence. Now, variance. So, uh, so this is uh, the code point. And all is variance, defined with var, right? So forget about type now. This is uh, from Arabic. So for the Arabic users, right, 
these, uh, this school point, and these are all listed here with the variants, are all equivalent. I mean, I can use one or the other, and they mean the same thing, right? So, uh, but as you can see, they are visually different. Some are visually different, some are visually same, but they are all different code points. Therefore, from the user point of view, you have to, uh, you have to define the equivalence of them altogether, right? Uh, type block is something I'll talk in a, uh, in a slide, but uh, in, essentially it says if you have this code point somewhere in the label, you cannot use this one, but I'm just moving too fast now. So these are all the variants. From a script perspective, all these code points are equivalent. Uh, may, a user may use any of them to express uh, what he's wanting to express. However, maybe some, uh, each one may be used in a specific language. Maybe one of the code points is used in Urdu, another in, you know, another Arabic in Africa, uh, you know, used in Africa. So it may not be easy to actually type one or the other because the keyboard is based on the language, right? But they are equivalent. Uh, uh, therefore, a owner of a label containing one of these, uh, one, two, so if I'm, uh, I want to register a TLD or a second level domain, whatever. And then one of uh, uh, my, the label itself contains one of those, for example, this one. Then I, I don't want other people to actually own the equivalent of the same label using a variant, right? Because then, you know, it's the same, right? So I either want to own or reserve the, all the alternatives, right? or disable someone else to actually register one of the alternatives, right? That's the only way, from my point of view of an owner of a TLD or domain, making sure that uh, you know, nobody else is using a similar or equivalent uh, variant uh, label. Arabic is one of those scripts where many code points have many variants. Uh, if all variants of each code point that has variants are allocatable, therefore can be used in DNS, then the number of allocatable variant labels can be large. Say there is a label uh, contains four code points. Each code point has five variants. That generates how many labels? A question four. to the room? <laughs> four, 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 five. Five. Four. Sorry? Four, four, five. Yeah? 625 uh, labels. Therefore, if if I, I have that label and I want to use it because it's an appropriate uh, you know, label uh, for in Arabic, then to make sure that I, you know, I have, you know, from the perspective of myself as owner of this name, of the label, then I had to generate the 625 different variants of that label and then do something with it, register them all. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yes, uh, and you want to? Why do you think what you're saying? <laughs> so, uh, anybody in DNS here and uh, uh, having managed some DNS root zone file, uh, DNS zone file, would see interesting <laughs> to have 624, 25 different, uh, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Records in the zone file, mm -hmm. all with xn dash dash something, mm -hmm. uh, and then manage it in a coherent way, right? So, you want to stay now, or so, so? I just I just want to make something very very clear. Um, uh, the reason that that equivalent there is in those scare quotes is because they're not really equivalent, right? The reason for that combinatorial explosion is because many of these spellings of these different labels are not real words in any language. So nobody would actually do that, but, but these things are the consequence of the way that we've assembled these things. So I don't want people to, like, I don't want to derail this into this linguistic thing. I just want people to understand that if, if you get up in the wrong room with, say, somebody from Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, and say these are equivalent, you're going to go into a rat hole that you never want to explore because you'll never emerge. So that was the only thing I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what do you got against Cambridge? <laughs> so, um, um, in the FGR, you could define rules uh, that are um, context-based. So, 
for example, uh, the when rule is uh, is you know here that says uh, this scope point uh, is only uh, could be used uh, when there is a context, and that is just a name that refers to a rules that they define later. Um, example of rules. Um, this is an example of a rule. This is again just a name, and uh, the comment actually does just tell you what it is. Essentially, do not mix an Arabic letter here with an, another Arabic letter there. So therefore, that rule says uh, it's a choice, so one or the other. And the, uh, the, the first rule says this code point with anything uh, after, including zero, and then this code point, uh, and then the reverse uh, one, which is uh, the, the second one, anything, and then the first one. right? So these are examples of rules that you could define in the AGR. Um, that rule is then applied later on in the file. It says, if you find a, a label that has that match this rule, then this label is invalid. Which is, if a label match, uh, that, then you cannot use uh, that label. So one of the difficulties uh, is uh, where to draw the line for encoding the script rules. Um, for example, uh, uh, sometimes uh, people think of, of their script that they should embed the grammar of the script. But in fact, uh, DNS are just a dead fire. So sometimes, uh, you know, it's just mnemonic. So for example, this is a valid label in, in uh, uh, you know, normally in ASCII, and uh, therefore you, you should not encode a rule that looks like, you know, you cannot have more than three consonants, right? So uh, it's, it's something in line where uh, you define rules enough that it makes sense to, to write those labels, but not going too far because we're just describing the grammar of the script or the language, and that's not the purpose of the DNS or the data GR. Um, yeah, uh, so each script or script family has its own specifics. Uh, some scripts are, are defined in South Asian, Southeast Asian scripts have uh, a consonant and vowel above and then the tone above. Um, sometimes the vowel is after or before. There's all, all kinds of different uh, you know, specifics. And then each of the DIGR has to encode that kind of uh, uh, rules, but without going too much into the ground. Um, and some scripts have different uh, Unicode encoding models uh, because Unicode uh, uh, has a different purpose than you know defining dead fires. So sometimes they choose to, uh, for example, in case of uh, for my language, uh, they could have decided to to encode only e with the accent and not e and then accent. So some of the scripts are actually encoded in in the kind of normalized form. Some don't and. It's all about uh, you know Unicode encoding design and model, and obviously that has an impact on the way you would write the LGR. So the end result is that the label is identified by a script by a script. The appropriate script LGR is then processed and applied to the label by an LGR processor. The output could be allocatable. Therefore, the label is confirmed to the LGR. Therefore, it can be assigned or delegated. It could be blocked because uh, by some rules of the LGR, or it could be invalid because it contains invalid code blocks. <coughs> I can experience the handling a process from a well-defined procedure uh, written by Andrew. Um, each script community get together, generation panels, to create and submit their LGR. Uh, these proposals are sent for public comments, and then the integration panels of experts validate and integrate the various sub submitted scripts of GR into an integrated one that will define the LGR uh, root zone. In parallel, second level LGR are also defined so that registries may use these proposed ones uh, or define their own. So, conclusion uh, DNS is a strict and dead fire mapping, languages are script. Uh, obviously, I just give you a glimpse of the rules there's, you know, well, I think you probably get the idea, but I didn't want to go too much into details. Uh, all the uh, scripts, uh, there are many scripts, uh, right now there are panels, uh, Arabic, Armenian, Chinese, Cyrillic, Ethiopic, Georgian, Greek, Japanese, Khmer, Korean, Lao, Latin, Myanmar, Neo-Brahmi, and Thai. 
our generation panels that are being uh, working on their scripts uh, GR, and there are a few of them already uh, published. Uh, so DNS has no variant mapping uh, suggestion. Uh, sh you should attend the DNS bundle uh, buff. AGR is a formal specification on how to validate the label for each script. AGRs for each script are being defined and integrated. AGR is used at the registration level, not in the DNS. Uh, defining AGRs is difficult given the fuzzy nature of languages and scripts, and maybe it's an opportunity for Yeti as a test bed to try things. <laughs> And uh, if you want to play, there's an LGR toolset uh, which has been uh, developed uh, under contract by ICANN, by us, and Patrick here is one of the main uh, contributors. Uh, it's been open source, and also there's a VM hosted by ICANN, so you can play with it. With. Uh, it has both uh, Python libraries, command line, and web interface, and information about this uh, uh, toolset is available there. Questions? Um, yeah. uh, one is to remind that the DNS bundle buff is on Wednesday morning. So if you want to attend it, Wednesday morning. And then uh, regarding the role of Yeti, uh, you said that LGR is only for registration, not for the DNS. Yes. Uh, Yeti is about uh, DNS resolution. Yes. So I don't really see how you could use Yeti for anything related to that. Uh, uh, right. Um, well, there's two things uh, uh, about this. One is uh, any uh, any work on variants in the DNS, such as DNS bundle or stuff, could be a good uh, uh, you know place to experiment. And, and also the fact that uh, you know the the question of, of scaling of the number of labels, if they are uh, you know they're not uh, allocatable, is something that that could be of, of interest. Uh, so and and. At the same time, this is about the root zone. So, is there anything on the, you know, over the DNS uh, work that could be useful? Uh, you know, well, unfortunately, there is a Yeti specific problem because Yeti committed itself to serve the original root zone without addition or change. So, for instance, even adding a DNAME to play with variants, for instance, uh, may raise some discussions. So, we, uh, we, may, we may change, but. Uh, uh, I agree. That, that's up to the you know Yeti uh, you know test bed. Uh, I see Yeti as a experiment and research. Therefore, you know that's kind of possible thinking. But maybe it's not. That's fine too. Uh, hi, Mark. Yes. Uh, actually, I'm not an uh, idea expert, and uh, I have a intuitive question. Maybe we already talked about it, but not following up. Is that if the variant or labors combining labors, especially the TLD level labors, increase, it, that means it will increase the root zone size if there is no bundle or CMM or such kind of. So, is that right now any variant? So, mm -hmm. if you have a label mm -hmm. and then there is, uh, say, five different allocatable variant labels. Yeah. Right, and then for during the process to ICANN through ICANN, they are all delegated. Ah, then, then and you know, that, into the that becomes uh, yeah, how did you say how many variants? So if there is four variants and then one label, uh, the, then five mm -hmm. five uh, different records NS records are in the zone, right? Mm -hmm. So the variant, I mean, the IDM will create the. How do you say the, the enlarge the increase of the that, zone five? That, that's the that's the potential outcome of this uh -huh. work, but it depends on two things: how strict is the LGR to uh, decrease the number of vari the allocatable variants, mm -hmm. right? So in this process of the LGR uh, integration and, and things, there is a a requirement for uh, the different script generation panels mm -hmm. to restrict the number of allocatable variants mm -hmm. so that at the end of the process there is less number of potential mm -hmm. variant mm -hmm. labels and then it may happen later uh, you know that you know though if I have five different 
uh, allocatable variant labels, uh, you know, then it's a question of I can community to decide if all of them are, you know, could be delegated or not, and that's currently being uh, uh, discussed uh, and through the community. So, uh, but yes, it has the potential. Mm -hmm. uh, what will happen in reality will depends on. What yeah, I just said. yeah, I heard some concerns on the size of the region. Okay, no questions? Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Mark. <laughs> uh, Present the current uh, status of our project. Uh, every time we update to the people who participate in the project or the people who uh, pay attention to our activity. So, this slide uh, uh, again reviews some work we have done and some, some, some items already maybe you know, familiar with. Uh, as I told you, that some people are first to, to join this. Meeting, so I will repeat part of them and quote some slides from from my previous slides and Shen also other other participants. Okay. So basically, there are two parts. Uh, the first part is project review, review who I who I am and who why we started the project and also what what are we are doing for the past years, past one one years and also the roadmap, where we are now. And the second part is the ETHDS findings. Uh, there are merely two parts, uh, the, uh, three parts. Uh, the first part, experiment findings, and I will leave it to Shen, ask Shen to introduce that part, because he gave a good presentation during the work meeting. And I will, I will introduce the second part and third part re related to operational issues and some preliminary results from uh, ESD data. Okay. Uh, the first one is what ESD is. I think uh, we repeatedly introduced this concept or, or to explain to many people what we are. And people have mentioned uh, we, we in, in our website there is a setting, there is an announcement that we are live root in a server system test bed for advanced root services. And you can call it a research, uh, alternative route for research. And we will have some trials on IPv6 only operation. Uh, yeah, we, we found IPv6 only operation, um, it not, especially in China, we do not have enough traffic because it's not, yeah, it's not uh, widely deployed and some islands are, look, uh, are there. And we also run some experiments on the insect and uh, we also, for, do something engineered part on relevant issues and how to monitoring, how to uh, update the, the domain file with the results. And we also track the scalability issues and so on. Uh, the goal of this uh, system is to uh, to explore, as we announced in our announcement, to explore the limits or possibilities of the DNS root name services. And hopefully we can deliver some uh, technical output uh, luckily, um, in the past years, uh, after we launched this, pro uh, uh, founded this uh, project, and we see some changes happen. It's not because of us. But we are luckily that we heard that the Anna finally uh, started the Anna, uh, the KSK role, 
and issue out their plans and implement plans. And also, we glad to say that the last root server, G root, uh, already uh, IPv6 enabled. And all, and also, I just come from come back from the India can meeting and have a discussion in the OSEC and OSEC caucus. I also uh, glad to hear that they have become more opening for the question of some studies in this field. Uh, for a period, for a quite period of time, we are uh, we are doing our work uh, just like dancing all the while. So we try to uh, not touch the. Uh, the controversial to uh, the topics, but uh, to, to, to commit to our goal and work. So we design the uh, models and experiments and try to give some useful and informative output. Uh, that's what is Yeti and what we are. Um, for more words, uh, Paul introduced uh, himself and Katu Sun. And I, I would like to introduce my colleagues and team. Uh, Shanker uh, joined BI one year ago and uh, later focus on the experiment and some innovations and guide our team to implement this experiment. And Kevin, please say hi to Jeff. Kevin, uh, he's the guy who sent mail to, to operators if, if there is <laughs> some feeling up. So uh, he's a man, uh, administration, the system actually. So actually, three of us work closely to uh, to to make this uh, work go uh, proceed. And I in charge of the a uh, lot of coordinations and yeah, and also approaching to people to to explain it and uh, try best to uh, implement some feedback and and send some messages uh, discussions in the Yeti community. And again, I want to uh, identify the promise statement of ET again. Uh, actually, as people say, that it's not easy to, to oh, it's uh, controversial to touch the problem of root server or root zone generation, but currently, based on our, my observation, our team of uh, work uh, focused on the uh, external dependency, uh, I mean, the problem statement. Than the external external dependency because local services right now some regions that are not capable to set up in that peering and cannot introduce uh, uh, more instance as some regions do so uh, it's introduced some concerns that the local services rely on the external local services so that puts some risk uh, on the top level of the architecture so uh, we are trying to look into it uh, and find a way to expand the system in a way to fit all scenarios, not only in the regions that allow free peering of the network. And also there are some salience risk that uh, was already described in our system uh, 17.6 to 26 and uh, Postmail, uh, Slim Postmail wrote down this, so we fully agree that we should pay attention to the privacy issues here. And uh, I think the two problems uh, uh, introduced majorly because the conflict between DNS centralization administration and against the network autonomy. So yeah, we, we try to, to provide uh, different models to, to alleviate the situation conflict. And we also focus on some uh, uh, Trials on IPv6 only, and some uh, uh, now now the case over process is uh, is already on the road. So, but at that time when we announced this project, it's not yet done. So, so that's another purpose of goal. Uh, we set up this ET2 test case K role. We, we do find some findings and some uh, expectation uh, unexpected results. So later, Shen can tell. Uh, introduce that problem. And also we try to uh, to do some uh, relumbling, uh, I mean the frequency relumbling to test uh, the system uh, feedback and monitor uh, the feedback. Okay, uh, that's what we are trying to serve, uh, to do. And the 
architecture desire VAT. I'm sorry, that's the quote of the slides we described before. Right now, the Emna is, is get rid of now the PTI in charge of the publication of the rules and uh, steer there is only one VM to uh, to operate to implement this uh, uh, assigning and distribution process. In our idea model, what Yeti currently do uh, is we introduce multiple side to uh, to increase more participation. And I, I think uh, Paul already introduced some uh, introduced coordination part how we implement this. And what's the vision of this model is that if I know, or now now the PD, PDI already in charge of this can sign different version of Zoom, so that will increase the possibility to, uh, based on the current protocol and the system, uh, do not break anything, then only introduce some procedures, some rules, then they can expand the system uh, for some reasons, for some uh, part network that can have their own replication system in their own end. So that's the uh, idea we proposed in the, in the initial uh, stage and and one year and a half. Uh, we the this system around and uh, we also find some some inconsistencies but we uh, stick to it because the, currently this uh, research trial the, the, the performance of the uh, it's, it's uh, we try to keep it uh, 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 state stable and concurrency, but it's hard to 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 guarantee that all the time. But we have a respond team given in charge of that to respond in the first time and inform the coordinators, DM operators to adjust to their uh, some changes to the department. Uh, I will introduce one example um, of this. Uh, this model, the advantage of the model. For example, uh, in the uh, in, in one case, uh, Paul uh, traveling and they had they heard the uh, uh, broken, and so they the SOA is not updated. So the DM from the Paul cannot send notification to notify to the uh, root server. So, but this system have the redundancy to steer. Uh, support the uh, server to update or replicate the uh, rules of file. So uh, in this model, we, we introduce the redundancy uh, if, especially given the case that no particular person are uh, uh, full time uh, focused on that, three of three of us can make the work um, better. Okay, that's the uh, why I think I don't bother to introduce this part because Paul already introduced that we how we generate the uh, the fire and how we synchronize with Sayana and how we uh, push and pull the update from each side to keep the uh, the content in con consistent. Uh, in the beginning, we share the same KSK uh, in the JSK. Uh, and just let the three sides do the same thing and physically uh, independent. Uh, later, we introduce multiple ZSK and ask that each DM operator can sign the zone, can publish the zone by himself, and so that it's not necessary to ask more coordinate efforts on the, I mean, the, the operational side. Uh, we are also discussed in the beginning of the uh, project that how is it possible to uh, to implement multiple even multiple threads anchor? Uh, I heard some some discussions in the uh, BGP. I think uh, they are talking about global trust anchor and uh, local trust anchor. Uh, I'm not an expert on that, but we can uh, open mandate to discuss that. It is possible that the reserver can accept pair node trust anchor and can. Uh, can work uh, as a redundancy purpose or um, like uh, uh, the comparing the performance purpose or to monitoring the uh, the uh, any any um, uh, operation mistake on the edit of the result. And currently, after some exploration of this model, we find the current software cannot support the multiple trust entry. Uh, uh, I, the tr multiple trust entry means they do not sign each other. So the current buy or other software cannot integrate this. Uh, when we approach to some people, 
uh, who want to try uh, ET uh, receiver for the MPV6 uh, pilot, they ask me the same question. Can we use the two systems in, uh, in, this, in the same time, just, to, just to like some, some algorithm use the IPI eyeballs to choose the best performance? But I tell him that, frankly speaking, if there is no solution for that purpose, even the, 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 I mean the play holders, the operator of each system, are uh, make it clear that they in, stick to the one namespace. There is no uh, technical solution for that. So, so I need, need to tell the people, uh, currently we, we cannot. So the current uh, solution, if you want to join Yeti, you can mirror some traffic to, to Yeti. And OK, that's the review of our uh, previous slides and give you some background if you are first to join this discussion. And I will give a roadmap or some events activities to give more uh, uh, specific uh, time and event. Uh, we started the project from the, the May of last year, 2050, and three coordinator uh, announced project and funded with the first uh, three DM and three root servers. And then we approached two people and asked some support from the community and by adding some Letter, uh, not letters, some domains for the uh, server. And we also do some experiment. I, I, I distinguish with different kind of PC. Uh, we, we tried first, to, with, with, at that time, there's no much traffic and not, not uh, so, so we, we just tried the KSK rule as the band default setting, regardless of the, uh, the time, timer uh, setting in uh, 1511. Uh, definitely, it's cheap. It's, uh, Field. Uh, and we continue to increase uh, the number of the root server and ask the help from the community. And we, uh, we uh, launched our MDSK experiments on February this year. And uh, before that, we have a goal that we can achieve uh, uh, to reach 25 uh, root servers that be our settings. But uh, still in the in the in the specs of the number, the logic beside uh, behind is that uh, we just by some calculation, if there is no signature contained, no yes error, uh, no, no signature required in the in the in the response, we in IPv6 MTO it can contain uh, at least 27, so we choose 25 uh, as a, as an operational number. Uh, given how the setting is choose as a number in IPv4 context. Uh, by that time, we increase additional servers. Uh, that's increased by uh, BI, and we hope to reach that number immediately. And if, if more participants join, we can uh, recline the servers and, and ask uh, to, to leave, leave additional room for them. Uh, in the May of 2000, uh, in May of this year, uh, we introduced uh, first idea from the Yarnet, and we also experienced a big DSK experiment. Uh, and later we ran the second ET case to kill over. And we reached uh, I, the current number and the current uh, operator by the September of this year. Uh, that's uh, during the process, I'm remembering some. Uh, uh, Adding and removing procedure happened between, and we uh, also do some uh, work to build the system stable and do uh, add some monitoring techniques to the system. Uh, now that current map from our website that we uh, have uh, 25 server running, most of them are in the virtual machine, and uh, but the, I'm glad to say that uh, the diversity of the software is. Uh, is really, is accept is uh, ideal and it's a new. Uh, uh, the, the participant tried the newest uh, the, uh, the release of the software, both the, the band called Note and uh, Bound and Pogins and also and Silver uh, uh, use the wa uh, Windows Windows DS. Yeah. Oh, there's no Unbound, right? <laughs> no, I'm not sorry to say. Okay. So in conclusion for the process, 
before the during this year, we focus on the development of the increase of the sortive cell of the rhizome, and then we prove to people we we build a monitoring system. We also uh, uh, implement some instant inside some area, and we collect data from the sort of side. Uh, but from uh, even in the beginning of this year, we have a when, when the number reached the idea number, we start to think about to introduce more traffic to to hit to against this to to test against this system because the the river the reserve behavior acceptance of the of the, this model is dependent on reservers, uh, uh, the, the feedback. So, uh, from just start from June this year, uh, we approach to uh, to ask for more uh, reservoir or queries or traffic. So, also we build some software tools to mirror uh, the traffic to our our site to to, to test that. So that's uh, divided into two parts. Now we are still in the second part. Uh, when we have collected some data, uh, we are start to build some uh, build a data analyzed platform that can be accessible for the people who would like to join. Uh, if they declare that he he, he has the, he had concern, if he has the willing to 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 keep the privacy of the data, we also do some anonymization to the address and and the, 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 the query name. On the, on the data MS platform. Yeah, that's slides we deliver a message that in the last I, APT meeting in Berlin, and uh, we found the cache is really efficient, and at that time only less than 100 queries. Uh, so uh, right now we have more than four, 400 or 500 because we increase more mirror traffic. Yeah, it do helps. And later, Xian will give an uh, introduction of what we do to, to, to develop some tools to increase data, uh, the traffic. Okay, the second part uh, focuses on the Yeti DNS findings. Uh, there are three parts, and I will escape this part because Xian did better than me. <laughs> yeah, Yeti is for research. And I will introduce the operational part and some findings. Uh, in the following slides. Uh, in the beginning, we choose a, a different root naming scheme uh, to avoid, firstly, uh, we, we, we observe the current root name is not uh, signed. So we hope that the, 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 the name of the server should be signed to, 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 to feed the gap of the last mile. So we choose a, a random, uh, how to, not random, it's a dependent name, regular name for each uh, each root server. And we also have an observation, also the, that's the discussion of the, in the ASEC caucus, there's a document about the naming of the, of the root server. They also has a uh, discussion, currently the root name, uh, root server used the name of .NET. So if .NET or sort of server are down, uh, the, uh, the root server is still alive, it may happen when the cache is live. There, there are no way to find to to reserve the name of the server. So uh, we design different uh, root naming. But this name, th this root naming scheme introduce some expected uh, some 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 issues like the glue. Uh, it, it current time uh, root system can if you ask for the NS a prime query, it can return if the EDS there. Uh, it's functional properly. It can return all the blues of root zone because the root server also host uh, the uh, root all dash all root server uh, dot add, yes dot org. So they can return all the blue uh, all the address uh, of the root zone, uh, root server. But uh, in in Yeti root naming, there are no such kind of setting. Uh, so we use some uh, software approach. To patch it and ask, and also uh, one of our coordinator DM used another way to host the uh, different uh, zone of each uh, uh, root zone, a uh, root, root server. So we resolved this issue, but introduce a patch to the current software. Uh, as far as I know, the current in, uh, the root server operators are not uh, all implementing these techniques. Uh, oh, it's okay. Yeah. 
uh, I think we just identify this is uh, operational issues and findings. And if you want to uh, change the name, you will, you will make attention to this uh, unexpected uh, compared to the current iron root server system. And we also found a, a bug in not two point there. I think it's already resolved. Uh, at that time, now to compress even the root. So uh, I think it's uh, noted, um, spotted by Postman. And there's a issue proposed in the seasonic uh, labs. So I think now it's resolved. Yeah, it's uh, unexpected. And we also, when, when we operate the Yeti testbed, we also found the current DNS uh, cap capture uh, software is not run uh, properly. Uh, there are two, uh, two issues. One is the, some, uh, the DNS cap bar uh, introduced some bars to drop some IPv6 pockets. So we try another TCP down for other, uh, other tool or two to, 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 to capture the pocket. And another issue is that when uh, the disk of the root server is full, uh, the, the DS cap still capture and override the data. When they upload the data, it's corrupt, corrupted. Uh, after communication with, uh, I think, the word, where some people maintain the DS cap? Uh, or do oh, or Oh, okay, people, okay. They, they, they fix the problem and, and, send, and send some feedback. And we already testing the lab scale, so I think it's already done. And we also observe some zoom transfer field in IP6 context. Uh, the first is that um, in one slide of Paul, uh, we mentioned the YAML file that asked the participant of the ETH server operator to announce to to make clear what address are are lead necessary to pull the zoom. From the DM and what address are public to the public services. We observe some, one of the reservoirs, they have their UI 64 uh, address uh, unintentionally. Uh, they do not know it's functional and it's asked the FXR and FXFR to DM, but the DM do not include the address into the into the uh, their ACL. So uh, it happens that in IPv6 contact, IPv6 network, the, the end host, uh, the end system may have multiple IPv6 address. Some are configured by the uh, uh, by the uh, state uh, the thing is uh, uh, DCPv6 uh, with a prefix you want to have, and some are just uh, just then the uh, root of uh, advice meant from the uh, uh, the routers, so they may have some uh, address by the source uh, selection for algorithm. They may choose it as a, a service uh, address. So may, it will increase some misconfiguration or ignorance on that use of the address. And we also uh, identify a zoom transfer delay for more than for more than. Seven, seven days, yeah. Uh, we found the Bundy, Bundy, and had the problem. Cannot support multiple DM, and they also reported in the mailing list. And another issue related to the zone transfer is spotted by Kedusan uh, about the IPv6 fragment lost. Uh, later, Kedusan will introduce that part in more detail. Uh, I think it's important to identify that, uh, that, that some issues when we run the IPv6 only uh, system because currently the IAB announced a statement to ask for IPv6 only strategy and practice. So I think it's useful to let people know uh, some, some issues run here. Okay, there are other operational issues. It's uh, common and every administration, um, administrator of the system DNS uh, server and system can, can encounter, can meet its uh, software, hardware, and network problem. It needs some debug, some trace root of the uh, trouble trees to, to choose the, uh, the, the, the issues. Okay. And finally, I want to uh, deliver some 
preliminary analysis of the ET data uh, based on the data set uploaded by a volunteer uh, server operator. Uh, we use, we, 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 I need to say, a special thanks to SID lab, lab, and they developed source code, source software, uh, open source software, it's called Intrada, and it helps to analyze large scale data set. And, and we also have a, have a good communication during we install and run and debug some, because the data collected right now from the Yeti uh, uh, is not, uh, there's some corrupt data and some misconfiguration, some data is only contain queries, it, it's broken the, the open source. We, we gave feedback to the internet people as well. And we, mm, yeah, we will talk about later about the data. So we have the preliminary focus, uh, the focus of data is the pocket size and the impact, any impact to the system. Uh, because uh, um, no matter we uh, increase more servers, I mean the root server, uh, the NS record in large the data set, uh, record set, it will increase the primary stocks. When we run the multiple ZSK, it it's, will introduce more uh, ZSKs uh, the worst case is to six ZSK in the ZSK rollover, row, row and also may happen there two PSK row in so that in total the, in the worst case there there will be uh, eight of them. Yeah, even even worse when we introduce a larger one, uh, bigger ZSK with two thousand fifty eight. But yes, uh, so that. One focus we pay attention to, and another is about reservers because we would like to know who uh, visited us, who are the main contributor of our system, so that we can keep connections and to 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 to, to trace some uh, uh, user, uh, so that they can give some feedback to us. That's work of data analysis just the beginning, and we set up this system just in two months. And we had to take uh, some effort, uh, uh, not trivial really effort, to to help to learn how to do this work. And I want to give two uh, graphs to show the length of uh, priming response and also the DSF key uh, response. Start from the uh, we learn, uh, we establish the system. It start from around five uh, five hundred. And when we increase, uh, when we increase the number of the NS record, it grows steadily. And there is a pink uh, uh, around the, uh, October of this year. It reaches more than uh, 19, uh, 1,900, uh, 1, but yeah. And also we treat, uh, treat the changes of the lens of the DNS key, DNS key response. And we found some increase, particularly interesting, to, especially when we do some experiment. Uh, there is a uh, larger uh, response uh, around uh, the uh, July last year. That's our first KSK role, which we introduced another KSK. So it's reached to a high point. And we, we withdraw that role um, after we found some something uh, uh, we've not considered uh, carefully, then uh, the, but not the, the second increase of the response of DNSK is the MZSK, we introduced multiple ZSK. So it's a uh, variety because the, 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 time cycle, the time cycle of the ZSK will go over changes. So uh, I I'm confused. Is it really bits on the Y axis? It's really big, it's right. not bytes. Uh, uh, right, okay. <laughs> oh, oh, I just copied from the document. Maybe there's some. Same for the previous yeah. slide. Okay, I will change it later. Uh, and uh, the big ZSK, we introduced a larger one, double the size of the ZSK. And uh, later, we uh, wrote the KSK, it uh, introduced a uh, uh, larger one uh, response as well. Right. Yeah. Oh. And we do some survey of the 
uh, independent uh, address who sent query to Yeti, we found that there are in total 2,391 uh, independent address and always also do some prefix counting. Uh, yeah, it's around uh, 1,500 and if the uh, prefix is equal to the uh, 72, we have uh, 716 uh, number of prefix, uh, uh, independent prefix. Uh, when I look into the, this address, we found that most of the address come from half, more than half come from Europe. I mean the right Pacific part, the networks, and the second is uh, Iran, uh, the uh, network, and the second is uh, ethnic and African and ethnic. And there is also observation of the uh, the reserver. Uh, most of them, I mean. I don't put the number here because I need here to check the data in, uh, accuracy of, uh, uh, after some search. Uh, most of them, uh, maybe seven percent, uh, more than thousand of them, independent uh, address do not uh, send more than one hundred queries. So many uh, address just just dig. Uh, we keep the uh, a set of stable queries. Uh, it said more than, uh, more than uh, 100,000 of uh, queries. We can uh, estimate that there are uh, two or 300 of uh, reservoirs and uh, our most of the queries. And there are a list of active IPv6 prefix here. I'm not sure it's uh, uh, against some privacy, uh, but I would like to thank the uh, entities that contribute the Yeti's uh, testbed introduce traffic to uh, our, our work. And I, I, I need to say the BI do some uh, metering and some deployment in some universities. You see the BUPT from Serena 2 and Beijing Jiaotong University from Serena 2 also, uh, is also carried by us. And we also uh, uh, mirror some recursive side traffic uh, to the to to the uh, system, and uh, as far as I know, uh, the M MSP IX also introduced some uh, uh, traffic from its background, uh, backbone network, mirrored them to IONA. We also noticed Citizen X and a lot of testing queries uh, after after search from the internet platform. I found there are a lot of uh, things that key uh, things. DNS key are record uh, uh, queries and response that introduce a lot of response. I think they are doing some experiment on the, on the DNS, DNS related. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through all of them. I just want to say thank you for the uh, entity and, and institute and companies to send traffics. We are promised to uh, keep the uh, uh, how to say the alarm, alarming, alarming of the, uh, the, the the data. When, when any people want to do some research on this. And their preliminary observation is that uh, currently the pocket size grows steadily when we start, after we start this project. And also, for my preliminary research, the, the search in the internet, the return of TCP fallback observed. Uh, and no matter how long, how large the pocket size is, even below the 1500. I'm, I'm not sure about the results, so I'm not print here some data. So that needs more explorings to check, double check the data. Um, because some data are corrupted and some data are messy, it's not uh, easy to make sure that all the data are, uh, because some are mirror traffic, some are the, the testing traffic. Um, we are, we are Next step is to classify or to choose the proper uh, the set of reserve to, to, to as a as a data set to, to re redo the data analyze. And currently we do not have the IPv4 traffic, so it's uh, hard to say that IPv6 uh, the performance of the system is uh, is uh, enhanced or uh, or decreased. So 
uh, there's no such comparison. Uh, but now we have we do have a comparison from the IP6 to Yeti that uh, and the IP6 response from Niana. Uh, we do the comparison on that. Uh, if uh, if there are consensus that Yeti can provide uh, in, uh, and another I mean IP6 interface for the uh, reserver uh, to to for a particular reason for the for example that IP4 and IP6 performance comparison, uh, we will do that after some consensus, if we can reach. Uh, and uh, there are more than half of the reserves come from Europe. Thanks for that. And we observe that uh, our server, the server operators contribute, I mean, contribute, their country or regions contribute uh, most traffic. I think they pro approach to the local people. And uh, especially thanks to Shen, you do a lot of, uh, work to communicate with people and uh, ask people to try IT and mirror traffic to us. Uh, yeah, we just start to do data analysis and there's still some work to do. For example, we are trying to mark the traffic that to distinguish the, uh, the traffic we connected from the real reserver and the, the traffic we mirrored on testing. Uh, we, we, we have some trial in the uh, mirroring tools to distinguish the traffic so that we can have more uh, uh, data can re reflect the, the, the situation of the recursive side and the system. Okay, uh, okay, as a conclusion, I think uh, we have finally uh, uh, to draw some results from the system is likely to see because we spend a long uh, time to build the system and coordinate and make the system stable and inconsistent. Uh, currently, we uh, we find some findings and results, and we also urge the people who uh, who would like to contribute yeah, to try to use ET or to use our tool to mirror some traffic. And more information you can visit our website. Uh, and that's all for my presentation. And I think. Uh, I have more words as an ending, is that uh, uh, our effort, uh, I mean the Yeti effort, uh, is maybe it's not a big deal, it's not even more um, sophisticated technologies so or work, but we open a, a window, uh, open a platform that we can talk about, we can do something that is never done before, and hopefully uh, we can trigger some some new ideas and also as input to the technical uh, personally policy uh, decision uh, process and we will come and comment and suggestion to us especially now we the system are ready we we, we need more input uh, from the community to help us yeah thank you any questions? Oh, perfect. Well, the sole objective is of this project. Ah. Ultimate objective of this project is a performance, high performance. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Uh, high performance is included in your objective. <coughs> That's what I thought about. Guessing. Then how do you compare mm. with uh, Google's approach? Ah, Even though yours is a more experimental, theirs is about production service. Yes, yeah, yeah. Are you looking for the... Uh, how, how do you compare? And uh, uh, mm. what's your next step? Mm. So you yes. have which Google service? You mean the load back, uh, or cache load back, okay. the Hoffman, right? Proposed. Yes, we have a long discussion with guys. Yeah, uh, start from 2014. We uh, we co-host uh, with uh, Sinek, Paul, and Comrade. Uh, uh, we set up a workshop on the root server system. At that time, yet you not not there. Uh, we discuss uh, different way to provide replicate replicant of the of the root zone files 
At that time, uh, there are several several proposals. One is the universal cast, one is the Kumrice and Hoffman's uh, to catch the root zone fire in the local uh, used loop back as a, as, a, as, a, as a way to access the root zone. And I, at that time, proposed that we can use uh, TCP to transport the primary response at that time to expand the system, not only for not only limited to 13. So I got that there are three proposals. Uh, I need to say uh, the Hoffman Kumrice draft, uh, uh, the, 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 the information I've said is focused on the performance to reduce the response time from the assertive side because there may be some iron and some uh, network is not uh, not good enough. So they provide alternatives uh, Pass uh, data pass to 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 get access to the data. Uh, for for Yeti, I think we are not. You can see the problem statement one and two. Uh, currently, we are not focused on performance. I, I think I, I mean the performance. It's not say performance is not important, but we are not focused on the reduced uh, reduced response time. Uh, we are focused on some. Uh, as we say, to reduce the re extensive uh, ex external dependency on the uh, outside infrastructure so that the local people can run their, their own services based on the single uh, namespace. That's the idea uh, that's different from the, uh, the, 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 the low back uh, solutions to, yeah, I think it can achieve the same thing to just cache and distribute uh, for their own use. Uh, but the scalability, I'm not sure. Uh, they can uh, do it in a small scale uh, or large scale. I I'm must not, I'm not have the, any data to, to analyze if they apply it as a great uh, carry grade level of the cache. I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing any uh, data or analysis of that. So, yeah, I, I need to say that different approach to different goal. Yet here, I focus on uh, the two and also some uh, technical considerations. Uh, basically, yet you want to just copy the same uh, model. We do not introduce cash as a major access to the root zone. Yeah. We need a DNS work, a DNSSEC work. Uh, we need to 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 uh, let the current system work at, at the end of the day. Yeah. And, and, okay. Thank you for your question. Uh, Yok. Yeah, so you just said um, on the resolver side there, you're saying there were about, you said mm -hmm. about 200, 300 resolvers that are actively using it right now? Uh, we just uh, searched the source address and count the number. I, I told that uh, most of them are just uh, some very less than 10 uh, transactions. So they're not reliable results. Yeah. So it's just a trial uh, for a while and, and dispute. And uh, in other words, I also want to call for some people who uh, have some experience on data mining or data science and help to join. Uh, we want to create a work party inside of the community and ask some, uh, we can do some work on that. Okay. It seems we have uh, enough time for the, set, for the first part. <laughs> Any questions or proposals? If not, yeah. Thank you for listening and it's good. Okay. I will I would like to ask you to have a break, but the beverage outside is not delivered yet. <laughs> so we can uh, one proposal is we can stop here and have a have a break and then we'll ask the people who provide the beverage we can serve more earlier. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. Okay.
Um, I think uh, half, half an hour, actually, for the brief. But we, yeah, the plan time is uh, setting half, three and a half to start, uh, to, to, to finish the first part, but we have more early endings. And we can return uh, half an hour later, and I will ask the friend. Okay, good news is the uh, ferries uh, will be ready in five minutes. So. Thank you. 
Ça, c'était l'autre
Quand ils sont en train de chanter dans la zone, ça permet au provider de les intercepter et de faire de d'envoyer cette page, puis de mettre sur la chaîne. Il y a tout un business autour de ça. Je pense que c'est une autre chose. Mais il n'y a pas que le voici. Thank <laughs> you. 
Ah, it's not. The place that everyone recommended, 
no longer exists in, in the story. Like, uh, I apologize to anyone who is at DNS Bulwark. <laughs> a slightly abbreviated version of those slides. Um, but I thought it was important to, to, to give them here. So, a little bit about how we do experiments in, in Yeti. So one of the things that I wanted to make sure that we did properly was to try to get as much useful science out of our experiments as possible. One of the problems that's, that's existed in the wider scientific community has been that um, people, people have, so for example, if you run a, a scientific experiment and you discover that half of your subjects uh, do not react to a medicine, and you decided to leave those subjects out of your study, then you would be criticized for falsifying the results. And that, as well you should be, because that's, that's falsifying the results. However, if you do 10 different studies, and half of them show something that you didn't expect, and you don't publish them, that's common practice. So it, this is a phenomenon that's sometimes called the file drawer effect, whereas if you don't find anything interesting, you just don't publish it. So one of the things I wanted to do was in order to try to give more credibility to the edict findings, is to publish what we're looking for in advance. In order to do that, we established a kind of protocol for how we, how we do our experiments. And it's pretty straightforward. We start off with a lab test, we make a proposal to the discussion list, and then assuming that the discussion is positive, we actually run an experiment on the edict platform, and then we produce a report at the end. It's, it's documented at that length there. Um, and we've also got a queue of experiments documented for all the experiments that are backed up. And again, especially because, as Paul mentioned, Yeti is a relatively controversial research area. We want to be sure that people don't criticize us for finding a bunch of numbers and pulling the interesting ones out and calling that science. We want to have actually something slightly more rigorous. So having said that as a background, I'm going to talk through the first three experiments that we did. The first one, which we've already mentioned, is the multiple ZSK experiment, we call it MZSK. And originally the Yeti project started with a single zone signing key. And we decided that because there's three distribution master, it would make sense for all of them to have their own zone signing key. And so the idea there is that we have a single KSK which signs signs all of the all of the keys in the DNS key R set. Uh, and then each of the distribution master will have the private key information for its own key and use that to sign the zone. And a resolver only needs to have a single one of those zone signing key signatures to match. So in the case of Yeti, we don't have signing ceremonies, as Paul mentioned. The KSK is still very much shared, including the private data. So in some senses, this whole setup is kind of a fig leaf. It's a fiction. It's not doesn't really provide any real separation. On the other hand, if we do come up with a signing protocol and decide to adopt using an HSM or something like that, then we know that this part of the, the, the design has been validated and works. Uh, so the big concern in this, as Davey mentioned in his slides, is that this increases the size of packets. And as you mentioned, in theory, we can have eight of these records. We can be rolling each of our zone signing keys and rolling the KSK at the same time. That's Four, four records being rolled, so eight records total. Um, in addition, when we started this, this, this protocol that Paul was talking about in his opening keynote didn't have support for this kind of separation, so we had to extend the protocol to, to have that, uh, which we did. Um, it wasn't a complicated extension, but that would need to be done. So we divided this up into two different phases. In the first one, we just really wanted to test the underlying software the, the resolvers and the authority servers to make sure they didn't break. So we we did it with seven DNS key records, which is, the idea was to simulate rolling all three of the ZSKs at once. Uh, so what we did was we kept adding more and more ZSKs until we had six of them in total. Uh, we watched what happened as we crossed, crossed the 1280 byte mark, which is the IPv6 uh, minimum guaranteed packet delivery size, which a lot of stuff fragments at we saw more fragmentation, which is what you'd expect. Um, we also saw failure at one of our root servers for UDP. 
Uh, strangely, at that root server, TCP did not fail. So the operator of that name server looked into it and then ended up being a known and fixed version of a kernel bug that was affecting containers or virtual machines or something strange like that. So they applied the patch and fixed, fixed their server and it all worked fine. We also started having incremental zone transfer issues. And this was the people running Yeti root servers who were getting their zones from the masters started having problems. Now, if, if you don't remember the incremental zone transfer protocol, it's fairly simple. For every new version of a zone, every serial number change, it gives a series of records to delete and a series of records to add. The problem that we were facing all of a sudden is that the, the signatures are different in each of the distribution masters. So this list of records to delete is different. So what does the, what does the authority server do in this case? Uh, in, in the case of NSD and BIND, it did probably the most logical thing to do, which is throw up its hand, give up, and fall back to a full zone transfer. Another possible option may be to try a different master. Uh, it depends on the specifics of your upstream setup and things like that. What is not a good option is to just ignore deletes that fail and then continue on normally. And that's what actually an earlier version of the not server did. And so what you would end up with is the not server would be returning signatures which would never, never get removed and it would no longer be valid and until you reboot the server. This has been fixed, so that's good. We are, you know, we're actually gonna be, we, we've, we've sent a draft and some discussion about this issue. I think that this might be useful for a short clarification document to the incremental zone transfer, just sort of advice for, for implementers. Say, by the way, if a deletion fails, this is a serious problem. It, it's not something you can say, well, if you delete something that wasn't there, it's fine. It actually is a, a significant problem and you need to, you need to figure out what to do in that. So, uh, Shane, yes. Did you actually um, look into the doc in, in the, the current document? Isn't, isn't the remark like that already in there? The, I believe the current incremental zone transfer document says something like, "Don't be an idiot. Make sure that everything's consistent all the time. You fool." Um, and I think that's that's reasonable advice. But in, in our in this case, we actually don't have a good solution. Now, I personally believe that. It, incremental zone transfer needs to be updated and retrofitted for the 21st century. Uh, for example, you don't actually need, especially with the case of DNSX sign zones, when you do a delete and then an add, you end up sending twice as much data as you need to really. It might actually be better to just have a, a way to say, delete the old signatures for this record and here are the new ones. Uh, there are, all, are a lot of other tweaks that could be done to make it slightly more efficient. But in the end, maybe a, a totally new, uh, interoperable zone transfer mechanism would be better. I, I don't know. People who do serious hardcore DNS operations tell me don't worry about it, you just replicate databases. That, that seems like a, a reasonable solution if you have a single vendor setup or you control that, that part of your environment. I don't know. Um, but we're straying a little bit from, from Yeti, so. Right, so once we verified that and we fix these bugs and made sure that we could actually send the zones uh, with the with the multiple zone signing keys and, and have it actually work as other resolvers. We actually moved on to the phase where we actually have separate MZSK or separate ZSKs, one for each of our three distribution masters. Um, so the process here was we added a new zone signing key. We wait two days. We switch to a new zone signing key. Wait another two days and then remove the old one. Uh, the reason we do this is because there's a, a TTL on the record and we needed to make sure that expired. Um, and in order to avoid overlap, we actually stretched these out so that four-day period was separate for each of our, of our uh, distribution masters. It doesn't have to be that way. We showed that it could work with overlap, but in order to keep sizes to a minimal, we tested it this way. Yeah. So, so just to make sure I understand, so when you're actually, so each distribution master is publishing the zone and it has the, does it have, it has the ZSKs for all three Yes, DNS, okay. Yeah, the, the, the DNS key research record set includes all of the public keys for everyone, all the time. The signatures that are in the zone are separate for each of the distribution masters. 
oh, so each distribution master, of course, was signing with its own ZSK, so you wind up with the R six coming from that one. Yes. Are going to be different from the R six coming from one of the other DMs. Exactly. But because the three keys are included in there, the validating resolvers can do that. Okay. Correct. Correct. And that and that's and that the diff that difference in signatures is what causes this incremental zone transfer issue. Yeah. So in the end, yeah, the multiple ZSK stuff basically works. Uh, we have a report written up on this, and we have, of course, future work to do to follow up on this. One is that, as I said, we have a shared KSK. We probably at some point need to look at what's necessary to not do that. And another possible extension might be that the Yeti masters, <coughs> or rather the Yeti operators who are slaving this data may want to validate that it comes correct for more than one distribution master. Uh, this would slow down updates to the serial numbers, but it would mean that you don't have to trust any one of the distribution masters. You could say, I want to wait until two or three of them have sent me the same copy of the zone so I can be sure that it hasn't been modified. Um, that's that's uh, something that we'll, we'll look at later, I think, see if it's, it's worthwhile pursuing. Jim. Ah, Jim. Question for you. This idea of using independent zone signal keys, are you thinking on the lines of perhaps you know, from some kind of future, you may have a scenario where someone may want to use a zone signing key using a crypto algorithm which is not supported by the registry directly? Let's say, for example, that. What's, what's the proposal? I'm sorry. Let, let's say, for example, I'm thinking the possible scenario could be is the Russians are told they've got to use Ghost Crypto. Ah. So if, if you're running a Senga zone which doesn't support cost crypto, could you imagine a scenario where you're talking about having these independent independent zone signing keys for what can be say for a cost flavor DNS key as opposed to say another C sign DNS key? So the question about using multiple algorithms, I guess, is interesting. I would be very nervous right now because BreakNCC did some research while they were doing an algorithm roll. And they discovered that having different algorithms between the KSK and the ZSK didn't work. There was a overzealous reading of the DNSSEC standard by the Unbound developers. And they said, no, a, mis a mismatch of algorithm types is, is invalid. And they've since been convinced of the error of their ways and have updated the latest versions of Unbound, but as we know, getting new versions of software takes quite a while. I don't know when it's gonna be safe to mix that. Now, it may be the case that, well, yeah, I don't know. So I would expect that this would break horribly on these older versions, and I don't know when we could ever hope to having, having enough confidence that these old ones have been cleared out that we can just mix and match algorithms. Okay. That's, Depressing, but that's the reality, yeah. All right, so we finished our first experiment, feeling very confident. We had planned on doing a KSK role as our next experiment, but then at some conference like this, uh, Dwayne Wessels, I think, announced that VeriSign is gonna be increasing the size of the IANA ZSK from 1024 to 2048 bits. We had already had this experiment planned for our own uh, purposes, we decided to accelerate it so we could do it before VeriSign did it in production. Now they had done lab tests and verified that it works probably with more software than we'll ever can possibly imagine, but we decided we have our platform for it, let's do it. So that's what we did. Um, we actually violated that protocol a little bit, and I'm a bit embarrassed, but I think it was justified because we didn't do, we didn't do a lab test for this one. My thinking for that was that a lot of people use 2048 bits for other zones other than the root. It's very unlikely that there'd be any special magic there that would cause it to fail for the root. And luckily, we were right, it did work without a lab test. Um, so we did a basic, the, with, we already had the multiple ZSK set up, we rolled in the new uh, 2048 bit ZSK and saw what happened. And nothing happened, it all just worked. Uh, it was no surprises, we're very happy. Uh, Going forward in, in Yeti, we're going to keep this 2048 CSK. I think that VeriSign has changed this for the root now? Yes. Yeah, okay. So we, Ayanna has caught up to Yeti and uh, everything's good. 
So our third experiment, which was going to be our second, was is a KSK roll. Now, as as Davey said, we kind of did one in advance. Um, well, let me. I think I. Yeah, I talk about it later. All right. So KSK roll. We want to do this before ICANN does their KSK roll. Now, uh, ICANN has a kind of KSK roll with a twist planned. So they're going to actually roll the KSK and then not revoke it right away, and then in, reintroduce the old KSK later with the revoke bit set, which will then empty it out of any resolvers which do that automatically. Um, we decided to first try the standard KSK rules documented in the RFCs, which doesn't have that kind of behavior, just to make sure the RFC way works normally. And then we're going to try the a method which more closely matches the, the proposed ICANN one as our next KSK role. A big problem with the KSK role stuff is that there is a RFC, which is what resolvers use to update their trust anchors, RFC 5011. And basically, there's a certain signaling that when you see a new KSK, you start thinking about accepting it, and then eventually you accept it, and then the authority server can start using that to sign things. The problem is that there's a mandatory hold down period defined in there, which is 30 days. And it's just in the RFC. There's no way to change it. Now, if you're in a test environment, you can do weird things by setting your system clocks and things like that. Or maybe you can just run a debug version of the code. If you're in a semi-production environment like Yeti, you just have to wait. And so it slows down our ability to do these kind of experiments. And that's just the way it is. As Davey mentioned, we did what I call an unplanned KSK rule early in the project. Um, we just generated the keys using DNSSEC keygen. It had timers in there. We hadn't really thought about it. And because we used all the defaults, it broke because of this RFC 5011 hold down timer. Although, BI9 continued to work fine which means that at least for many versions of BI9, it doesn't respect that 30-day holdout timer. I don't know the, the real motivation for this. To me, that seems probably like a good thing. I mean, I think the holdout timer is stupid, so I think it's just a big pain in the butt. It doesn't make any sense to me, but um, a lot of people seem to think it makes sense. And the unbound uh, did break, which is kind of what you would expect because that's what the RFC recommends. So getting back to our, our plan role, we started it and it went a bit bumpy at first. So we accidentally made a ZSK on our first key generation instead of a KSK, we fixed that. Um, and then a much bigger mistake was that on our website, we published the KSK and we didn't publish the new KSK there, which means that anyone who was configuring their resolver based on that would not have gotten, they would be behind in their role. So, we fixed that, updated our documentation, and restarted the timers. After we started the experiment, a draft was published in the ITF, which we're all here for, and about security considerations. And the problem here is that in, in DNSSEC, you've got actually a couple of timers to worry about. You've got the TTLs on the records themselves, but then you've also got a signature validity period. And you have to keep that signature validity period in mind as you're doing your, your stuff. Um, so this document defines the actual set of timings that you need to do in order to be safe in your role to make sure that no one is able to do a replay attack. So what a, a replay attack is, is just getting an old version of a signed record and then sending that. If an attacker can do that in this case, they can actually cause you to reset your RC 5011 hold down timer, which we all hate by now. Um, and what would happen if they cause you to reset it is that when the real record rolls in, you won't use it and your, your resolver will all of a sudden start failing any DNS tech lookups, which since you're starting at the root, will be all of them. Um, well, except for the CCTLDs, which aren't signed, will be fine. Um, so even worse is that one of our participants had pointed out this problem to us before this document was published, early on in the thing, I had overlooked his, his recommendation, and, and I wish I hadn't, because actually then we could have been the one to publish this draft and, and 
pointed out, and we wouldn't have had this problem in our stuff. Anyway, oh, this is all just explaining that. Yep. Oh, well, one good thing to note about this is that with the current ICANN proposals, they're safe from this, so it's not, it shouldn't really be a concern for anyone, but it's good in case anyone is doing a separate RFC 511 uh, environment. I don't know how many, I don't know how many TLDs actually use RFC 511, but if someone does manage their trust anchor separately from the root, it can be done. Uh, let's see. Now, what we didn't do was stop, what we could have done is stop our experiment, adjust our timings, and then restart it again. But I decided that probably we shouldn't do that in this case, because the Yeti resolvers are usually, everyone configures this on purpose, it's all opt-in. People doing this monitor them pretty closely, and I really didn't want to add another 30 days to our experiment. So we left the timings as they were, let the experiment go. As far as we know, no one, no one attacked anything. It would still require a man-in-the-middle style attack or Kaminsky or something like that to, to actually attack one of these resolvers, so <coughs> it wasn't very likely. What we'll probably do for our next roll is leave these timings in place and try to issue a denial of service attack using this replay on one of our own servers, uh, basically to prove that the attack works in a production environment, uh, and hopefully it won't affect anyone's service. Once we've done that, then we'll keep it in mind for future roles. Right. Another discovery from this KSK role is that one of our engineers, Kevin, <laughs> was modifying one of our BI9 resolvers, and he added a new view, which is quite a normal thing to do in BI9. Um, and the view inherited the trust anchor from the global configurations for the zone, or for the resolver. However, it didn't inherit the RFC 5011 status. So even though a role was in progress and BI9 was tracking that, for the new view and the new view only, it didn't actually create that. So what that means is that if you are running a resolver with multiple views and you're, man you're ha counting on BI9 to manage your role automatically, you create a new view, that new view will at some point in the next few weeks or months perhaps fail. Um, so, what I think we need to do as a community is I think ICANN needs to take this into account and issue guidance for BI9 operators and make sure that people are aware this is a possible issue. If they don't, even if they do, someone's going to mess it up. But if, if they do give this recommendation, at least one or two administrators somewhere are going to save the pain of having customers call them up in the middle of the night. Yes. Um, is it because you defined a new view while you were doing key rollover, or is it view that were defined before? No, it's, it's a new view. It's, okay, a new it's view. because it's a new view. Oh. Makunda, our, our resident by nine developer, is here to explain. So basically, RFC 511 is about root key rollover, right. or rather any key rollover. Trust anchor key, rollover. Yeah, trust anchor rollover. Now, this is only applicable to resolvers that observe the rollover. Like uh, RFC 511 does not talk about initial trust anchor configuration. Mm -hmm. It only talks about um, resolvers that, that are able to do the rollover based on observing the rollover. So if you if you start a new resolver and you configure it with new trust, current trust anchors, then validation will work. But if you have obsolete trust anchors before the pre-rollover mm -hmm. trust anchors, then obviously it, the resolver is not observed the rollover because you're starting it now. With a view, that's what happens. Yeah, right. you, the managed keys provides initial trust anchors. So you always need to provide current initial trust anchors. It's a fair observation that, that RFC 5011 defines observing changes and, and so on. Nevertheless, I think as a, as a, as a regular old BI9 administrator, I'm not going to be thinking about the model that BI9 is using. I'm just going to be adding a view and getting back to the 7,000 other things in my, key, in my ticket queue, right? <laughs> I, I think the by 9 behavior should be modified so that views inherit this kind of global managed keys. Um, if, if not otherwise specified. For, and for the record, there, there aren't any global managed keys. It's a view based, like, the, when the rollover happens, the keys are stored, the new keys that are observed are stored in a view specific database. So it's within a view rather than some global statements. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, well, apparently this is being discussed internally at ISC. Uh, <laughs> but you're right that uh, from an administrator's point of view, um, for, for an administrator, for example, who's, who's starting a bind, uh, bind program, an AD program, uh, that, that was built way in the past, for example, yeah. they, they need some automated way of getting those initial trust anchors. Yeah. Paul? So, I realized that the original design of BIN 9 is now 17 years old and may not be particularly relevant, but the expectation that we intended to create is that um, Almost anything you could define at the zone level or the view level had a global default that you could set. And exactly how that was implemented, whether it's a per view table or whatever, it was, uh, uh, it's not something that system notes are supposed to know about. So, in other words, doing this at the global level was the expectation that we deliberately set. Um, <coughs> so, I tend to agree with you that. Uh, by nine is uh, violating the principle of least astonishment in this case. Yeah, so we'll see what happens. I'm sure there's many other issues that, are, that we're going to pop up as ICANN gets closer and closer to the, the day when they roll the route, but I think this is one of them. Right, so as in conclusion of the K-roll experiment, we're still pending a formal write-up of this. Luckily, RFC 5011 basically works, said there's some concern over the finite behavior. But it's only in this one case, so we'll see how it goes. Those are the three experiments we've finished. We have a long list of pending experiments. As I mentioned, we want to do a KSK roll with this denial of service attack that, uh, that I discussed. We want to try root server renumbering. Uh, I would like to see a rollback of RFC 5011. So we have this annoying 30-day hold down timer, which is supposed to save us if something nefarious happens. What happens if we actually go back? Like, does everything just magically continue on without any problems? Or, I don't know. No one's ever tested it as far as I know. Uh, we want to try lots and lots of root servers. I call this faker uh, because we're not going to try to go out and get another 400 participants in Yeti. I think but what we can do is use different IP addresses and different domain names. Um, this is going to require a significantly more lab testing in advance to see what the behavior of different resolvers is. Uh, there's also the Dottie uh, option. And this is some of the work that, that Davey was talking about, about looking at how root servers are, are named. Right now, it's .rootservers.net. There's been some discussion in RSAC caucus about making a separate label and putting that in the root. We may, we, I think we can do that within the EDA experiment, because we wouldn't be doing any delegation. We'd be adding a label. It's possibly on the edge of what we've committed to do and not do. So we need, we need to discuss that a bit more thoroughly because we, we don't want to make the label you know, dot web or something like that. Um, another experiment is priming truncation. Uh, this is an idea to force all, all priming queries to TCP. Uh, David mentioned this idea of having, having priming happen over TCP. We can actually try to force that by sending the truncation bit on all priming queries and see how many of the resolvers are able to succeed. We definitely want to try ECDSA. We need to do all of that. Uh, Paul also mentioned we want to try frequent ZSK rules. We want to try that. And finally, I don't know if this is going to happen. My own, my own dream is to try a TCP only route and see what happens. <laughs> I love TCP. I think we should get rid of UDP. I hate it. Um, anyway, that's it for the, the first three experiments. And any more questions? Some of the experiments will be also a social experiment because they will require some reconfiguration of all wood and servers. Uh, the case uh, the case Kawo, for instance, the uh, wood server operators had nothing to do. Yes. Um, not even to check because it was only for the resolvers. But uh, going to a TCP on the wood will require that every WGT wood name server works. And there are many wood name servers, and I'm not sure that all the operators are here. So it's also a, a so social experiment. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
That's true. <laughs> yeah, it would it will be interesting to see how that happens. We we try to manage the communication, but it's an all volunteer project with busy people, so we'll see. And we may need to come up with some sort of method to roll it in, eliminate people if they're unresponsive after a certain amount of time, and things like that. It'll have to be yeah, it'll have to be discussed as part of the experiment. Yeah. Right. And from your list, Shane, I'm, I'm not seeing the twisted 5011 row. Yeah, so oh, are you it's, on, it's on the web page. Uh, oh. But you're right, it's not on the list. I apologize. But you guys are about to do it, or? Uh, I think the next experiment we're going to do is the KSK roll with the replay DOS, DOS zeros, uh, just to test that it actually is a valid attack. Uh, and then, and then we'll do the. We may also need to run experiments in parallel, because of this thirty-day hold-down timer. It makes KSK rolls very slow. So we, we have discussed it, and I think we're comfortable running multiple experiments as long as they're not too dramatic. Um, yeah. There's also I also have some ideas which aren't on here, uh, which possibly we'll discuss at the end of this session, or like other ideas and things like that. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I have a uh, adding to the experiment part. Uh, at uh, for a period of time, we are trying to try new things, but uh, we are uh, the process in the Yeti project is to propose and lab test, then ask for consensus first in the coordinator team, and then to discuss. Sometimes some proposals well, is not. To be clear, the, the, the process is to send it to discuss. Oh, if, yeah, if, yeah, if it gets yeah. discussed in coordinators, that's something yeah. that we do sometimes, but it's not yeah. necessary. Yeah, right now we are uh, lack of energy or time to summarize all this down in the decent way, right? So we hold on some experiment, you know? So uh, we also would like to, the people who join the discussion can propose new ideas, Absolutely. and so that we are not just busy thinking of experiment we want to. Yeah, yeah this is a long them. list, but yeah. if anyone has any, something, something that they want to throw into the system, I'm very happy to discuss that with them, yeah. Okay. Although not all experiments are possible, so Stefan mm -hmm. proposed a DNAME experiment, which we basically, basically rejected, because it seemed to modify the Contents of the root stuff. So. Yeah, the name issue uh, is. Uh, I also propose the dot yeti root, right? Yeah. 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 Okay, great. In that case, I think we're ready for. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, okay. According to the agenda, yes. Thank you, Shen. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> some uh, particular points. Ah, <laughs> sorry, I'm not sure <laughs> it can play. Dude, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> almost nothing. <laughs> oh, the source code is okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mark, can you help us out? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can use your laptop yeah. to. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the TCP MTU issuing IP uses. Um, a lot of IP review in this community. Um, the, so uh, when when you want to send larger packets of IPv6, uh, if the transport support the uh, the larger packet, so it's okay. But in some cases, uh, the like a uh, uh, 1500 byte interior is not allowed. Then what happens? So original assumption is that PassMT discovery works well to reduce packet size, but in some cases. PassMT discovery may not work because of the ICMP filtering. And in this case, the TCP session, 
uh, breaks. And the other issue is that TCP doesn't handle IPv6 MTU issue correctly. And the, this was observed in several variants of DSD. And this is because the TCP tried to ask the peer to send a larger packet such as 1440 instead of 1460, which was a, in the IPv4 case, but in IPv6 1440. So uh, um, then IPv6, IPv6 uh, uh, six layer divide the packet into multiple fragments. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't get confused, but uh, the TCP tried to send the, the segment whose size is 1440, then the IPv6 layer uh, may want to uh, fragment into smaller chunks, FD, especially if the uh, 2080 is specified. <clears throat> and also the fragments may be filtered due to the uh, router ACL or some middle box, especially the security middle box, do not fully really support the fragments on IPv6, uh, which will drop the fragments. And in this case, the TCP session breaks. So that is very bad. And that problem is, this particular problem uh, has been reported in um, discussing in IP uh, six month mailing list several times, uh, almost once a year or something like that. Uh, but, but the content is almost the same, but there was no conclusion. And the problem is still there, unfortunately. <clears throat> so this is not specific to DNS, but in the case of EAP project, we don't have the mechanism to fall back to IPv4. So this is very serious for us. And some of the folks are proposing TCP only sunset. So that is <laughs> yes. essential to, to mitigate this. So <clears throat> um, the the point is that the uh, RFC thirty five forty two defined the IPv six use minimum min MTU uh, to avoid uh, dependency to the custom MTU discovery. But unfortunately, TCP doesn't see if the sockets option uh, is IPv6 use mean MT is set to one. So TCP tried to send a bigger packet and a lot of the things could happen. So my proposal is the three portion. One is to local MSS to be uh, 2020, which is uh, the 2080 minus IP6 and TCP header. Uh, so that the no local fragmentation is uh, required. And second is to advertise the MSS option in TCP to be uh, 2020, uh, 12 trillion, sorry. So that the remote side doesn't have to make a fragmentation. Uh, then even if the remote fragment, uh, remote side doesn't have support this, uh, maybe to keep the TCP conversation. And third one is the, if the remote side advertises larger MSS option, then if the IPv6 use mean MTU is set, the creep to the MSS value effectively to 1220. So uh, the last discussion on six month mailing list that the, the, this is the right not to control this, but there is no other suitable uh, place defined at this moment. So we may need to end up to use this uh, IPv6 is mean MTU. <clears throat> so I worked a little bit on the NetBSD 7 kernel and the some uh, patches uh, available on the modification there's just only a few lines addition on those three files. TCP input.c and TCP output.c and TCP server.c. So I'm not a kernel developer, a kernel hacker. So this may not be uh, the optimal or best or correct, but it, uh, currently my laptop runs the kernel and uh, doesn't have any problem at this moment. And this patch is being reported to the uh, NetBSD current users in several days ago. And so this is the, uh, the, the point. So this is a uh, patch to TCP input.c. So if the socket option 
include the, the IPv6 minimum MTU and that value is min MTU all, which is to use minimum MTU not only for multicast but for unicast packets. Then in that case, the uh, our max set when they are PMX is graph to mean minimum of the original values and the IPv6 uh, MMT, which is 1280, minus uh, IPv6 header and this data. So similar patches uh, resides in the three files. <coughs> so anyway, uh, I'm going to apply uh, this patch to the uh, YDM um, and debut it probably in the early next week. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> not next week. Today is Saturday. <laughs> so the, the, probably the, the party after. Like, yeah, after I, I, Yes, as soon as I return that. After. <laughs> so, and uh, report me back if you have any inconveniences. If you are uh, especially for the uh, ERT root sub operator. So, that's it. New question? Yes. Can you go back a few slides, please? Mm -hmm. The previous one. Yes, this one. Yeah. So um, in BIND, we used to, previous behavior in BIND was that we used to set this uh, socket option all the time, IPv6 use min MTU. Mm. All the time with, uh, um, uh, this was clamped basically to 1280. We, what we observed was that on a free BSC at least, we got a bug report that even though this this was set to 1, min MTU was set to 1, and 1280 one, one, should have been the maximum segment size for TCP. Mm -hmm. It was going about 1280. So this is not sufficient. Like even with this option set, uh, FreeBSC was using, FreeBSC was allowing segments, TCP segments to be larger than 1280. And so they were getting fragmented at the IP layer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So additionally, yes. we had to set uh, another TCP socket option mm -hmm. to uh, set the MSS to, I think we set it as a value 1280. But you're talking about 1220, you may have to check that. Mm -hmm. But we additionally had to set this again to this 1280 so that FreeBSD IP, uh, sorry, FreeBSD TCP layer would set, allow only, uh, would only use a maximum of 1280 for TCP segments. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, oh, this, um, um, do you think if the uh, uh, latest version of Vine set that option yes. as well? Yes. Um, yeah, this problem has actually reactivated. Uh, in EAT project, this is not the EAT infrastructure, but uh, the one of the why uh, DNS machine is going to be a, a secondary of EAT-DNS.org and pulling the zone from port machine and its stack. Then I debugged it. So Which version of BIND do you use? Um, I, I think the 910 for the... Uh, yeah. I think by uh, 9.10 and something. Okay. And with the uh, latest version of the previous account. Yeah. A few months ago, this was updated basically to set the MSS on the um, on the TCP socket as well to 1280. So after that, you will not find this um, happening. Okay, let me check anyway. But that option is only available on the previous day. That is my question. Socket option. Mm. I'm not sure actually. It okay. should be it should be available across. Mm. Okay. Anyway, let, let me check anyway. Thank you very much for your session. Okay. Thanks. Okay. You another slice for your software feed, a piece of software. Turn it on. Why I cannot display this one? How to fix? You like this one? Yeah, this one. Can you play it? That's not. This is very strange. Can we go to the whole screen? I'm not sure. Is that possible? Something. Oh, I think it was. 
So now I'm going to spend, uh, I have a two lightning-ish presentations about some software that we worked on recently. Uh, the first is the YMMB software. Uh, so this is an attempt to address one of the fundamental problems that we have in Yeti, which is that we don't get enough traffic. In order for us to be a valid, realistic representation of a root server, we need as many resolvers pointed to us as possible. But because DNS caching works really well, it's very difficult for us to get large amounts of traffic. Even a very, very busy cluster of servers doesn't really send that many queries. So for example, at, I think in the last ITF, uh, Warren Kamari was talking about the uh, NX domain is really NX domain. Uh, draft and he said they implemented that on Google resolvers and so each Google resolver now sends less than 50 queries a second to the root. These are probably some of the busiest servers in the world and they're not very busy when you look at the traffic they're actually sending to the root. So because of that, even if we add hundreds of more resolvers pointing to Yeti, we're not going to get that much more traffic. Not, that's not a reason to not do it, but that's, that's, that's the foundation of the problem. So how do we get traffic? Of course, the best way is to just configure real resolvers. There's a, there's a tension here because Yeti is an experimental network. You saw my list of potential experiments. Some of them may cause things to break quite badly, and we don't want to expose users just trying to go about their day-to-day -day interneting to, to broken internet service. <clears throat> so there are good solutions for this. David was mentioning the work that we've done with BUPT. In those cases, they have buildings for classes and maybe with teachers and things like that that use special SSIDs. This is actually a pretty good solution because a broken Wi-Fi network is something that users are already accustomed to dealing with and they can change to another Wi-Fi and everyone's happy. So that's actually a pretty good solution. But in general, there's not many good, there's not a lot of good solutions here. Another possibility to get traffic is just synthetic traffic. We can generate traffic all day long, right? A, a, a Python script can generate enough to, to simulate a busy resolver. And we can stress the network and we can stress our servers. Unfortunately, it's synthetic. It doesn't really represent what real users would send. We can also do something kind of in between, which is where we mirror production traffic. This is something that the Moscow Internet Exchange uh, set up first, explained in our last Yeti workshop how to do this. It's good because it's real traffic, and that's good for Yeti because we get real real load, we get real query patterns and things like that. Unfortunately, because we don't actually send the answers back to the users, if something breaks, no one sees it. It's a tree falling in the woods and no one hears it. So that brings us to YMMV. And the idea here is it is mirror traffic or replay traffic, this kind of thing, but we actually check the answers that we get back and compare it to what IANA gave us. That way we can detect if something is going wrong with the system. So what are the design goals? I decided to write a piece of software to do this. Very, very important for me that this be easy to use. And because no one is getting paid to work on Yeti, and we're asking administrators who are very busy to help us out as a favor. I want it to be very simple to install it, very simple, very simple to run it. It also had to be somewhat flexible and work with existing environments because people have different requirements. They may not be able to run software on the resolvers themselves. They may be able to. Uh, they may have different ways of capturing packets and things like that. So, so it had to be a little bit flexible. I also wanted it to be informative, both for the person running it, because they're the ones, I wanted to try to give them a little bit of benefit for running it, something interesting. If there's no benefit, then it's going to be very, very hard. It's already very, very difficult to convince people to run this. But I wanted there to be something interesting about it, and also certainly useful for us as Yeti operators. And it has to be completely safe. It cannot affect production service, and it should also be privacy maintained. So those were the, the, the goals going into developing the software. So based on that, what kind of design choices were made? I decided to use Go. Um, partially because we just had a little bit of experience with it recently as a language, and partially because it's almost like someone designed it for this problem space. It's relatively fast, good concurrency. There's a really good DNS library built for Go. Uh, Meet Gibson wrote it and actively maintains it. It compiles to static binaries, which are not my favorite as a system administrator, but for this case, if I just want to give someone an executable that they can run, it's great. 
And for an administrator, it's also good they can distribute it to their entire, entire all their servers easily. Um, and also in Go, dependencies are quite painless. Uh, there's actually, and it turns out with YMAD, Go resolves all the dependencies. There's like three commands to, to install it, right? Um, I also decided that we weren't going to do packet capture in the application itself. The idea is that it's easier to migrate to different formats, easier to work with different environments, and, and all these kind of things. And I wanted to be a simple command line application because that's I'm a simple guy and I like command line. So what does this actually mean? Oh, I have a laser pointer. Thank you, Stefan. Only one color. Disappointed. Um, so this is this is this on the left here is your current environment. You've got your DNS resolver. It's going out over the internet, which is this handsome cloud here, up to the IANA root servers. So that stays the same. What you need to do is somehow capture PCAP from that. In the future, it could be other formats. Then there's a lot of interest in Cybor and things. Cbor, Cybor, Cbor. Anyway, and other formats for capturing packets. Right now, we use PCAP. It's ubiquitous. It's easy to understand. We take that through a program called PCAP to YMMV. This does only a couple of things. I'll talk about it later. And then it passes it off to the YMMV. This is the guy that actually does the work. It sends queries through the internet again to the Eddie root servers. Does a comparison and then shows you what it got. So pretty straightforward. The yeah, I talked about the PCAP as input. Uh, right now, it's just it's all wrapped in a script. So you can use TCP dump, you can use T sharp, you can use DNS cap, whatever you want. You can use live traffic. You can replay it later. It doesn't matter. And we've got our PCAP to YMMV program. This converts PCAP to a custom format. And the reason I wanted to do that is that I wanted to do a little bit of filtering. We only want to look at traffic to the IANA root servers. And I also wanted to match queries with answers, um, which it does. And that's important for looking at performance comparison, which we'll see later. And then finally, the little program YMV, which does the actual queries and comparisons, which is pretty straightforward. You just send a query and get an answer. So what we, of course, in the tradition of all great software as a software developer, I decided to add a bunch of features because that's what I like. But the most important thing, of course, is to detect differences between these two. It's not a straightforward comparison because, for example, the NSR set return for dot is different. Uh, also, the IANA root servers are authoritative for in to ARPA, which our servers are not. We just delegated its normal zone. Uh, the, the IANA servers are authoritative for root servers.net, which we are not. We just delegate it, and these kind of differences. So there are, there are differences, and this comparison tries to keep those in mind and not produce a bunch of false positives. I think I've gotten all the false positives done now, but as people throw new resolvers at it, they'll probably discover other garbage. Other garbage. Uh, another thing which I think is cool is that we actually get a comparison of the performance. Uh, I'll show some slides later showing how that is. That's interesting. Someone was asking earlier about how well the Yeti system performs compared to IATA. Well, you can't know that for the whole system, but you can know it for your own resolvers. And that, 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 this program will tell you that information. We do server selection. We have a bunch of algorithms. Uh, we do. I actually implemented an RTT algorithm based on bind 9.7s. It's not complicated, it, but it, it does this kind of uh, smooth RTT stuff. And then it also does just plain round robin, pick one in a row. You can just pick one at random, and you can also send. You can also, if you want to, send every IANA query that you see to all of the Eddy root servers. That's really good for generating lots of traffic, and it does all the same work, so that's probably the best way to run it. Not the default, but the best. We also have an unusual EDNS buffer size. This is something that a, a, or a Kato suggested, rather. And the idea here is that it's hard for us to see which traffic is real and which is synthetic. We, we've marked all the traffic now. So if we see a packet with this, with this size, for EDNS buffer, it's close enough to a normal buffer size, and, but it's also a bit weird, so it's probably coming from this program. We can't ever know for sure, but it's a good chance, a good, a good, good probability. We discussed other ways of tagging these queries, like adding a private EDNS option and things like that. But this one seemed like the easiest and the most likely to go into a firewall. Yeah. Um, in terms of preserving privacy, we obfuscate query names by default. You can turn that off. Uh, so if you're just querying for a TLD, 
we can't do any obfuscation. We actually need to send that data. That's how we get the NS delegation. But if you're sending anything else, then it converts it into YMDD dot, and then that's a hash, another example. This hash for any execution of the program is always the same, based on the same input. Didn't have to do it that way. I could have just picked it random. But I like. I thought it might somehow be useful to have consistency. You, this this is not the same for every every invocation of the program. It generates that key randomly, or you can specify it when it starts if you want it to be consistent for every time you run it. I, it's a bit over engineered, but I had fun doing it. And finally, important is that we can send daily reports if you as an opt-in. You can specify an option either SMTP or using SendMail, so you can collect those. If you don't give it a target address and you turn on reporting, it'll come to a role mailbox that we set up at BII. So if you want to help we can, and just send us reports, that'd be good. And we can hopefully over time get more, more people running this and start to collect a sort of uh, set of data about how the, how the system works. I have a few slides showing how it works. There's a script that ships with the called capture.sh. Run that with the interface that you're running on, and that's it. I ran it twice because I have a <coughs> I have an IPv4 connection for my ISP, and because my ISP sucks and doesn't have IPv6, and tells me that don't worry, they have plenty of IPv4 addresses, I have to run a tunnel with from Hurricane Electric. Thank you, Hurricane Electric. Um, so that's it. It's really quite simple to run, and this script can be modified if you want. That This script is where you specify which type of capture you use. You can also specify options for the program and things like that. So what does that actually run? So I did, you can do a PS here and see what's running. It's running a TCP dump. Um, right now I'm only capturing UDP. My thinking here is that going to the real route, I'm not sending anything that's gonna be, gonna give me an answer larger than a UDP packet. So there shouldn't be any truncation, it should get everything. And um, this is the converter, and then you see how it runs right there. And I'll go through all these different options. So there's just a couple of runs and it's quite straightforward. What do those actually all mean? Uh, we increase the verbosity of the logging. That's just because I'm a developer and I want to see all the stuff that it's doing. It goes to a log file in temp. You can ignore that if you want. Um, it's mostly helpful, again, for development. Uh, you also specify where to log the performance data to. This is a comma-separated variable file, or comma-separated values. And that's just so it's easy to import into Excel or whatever. And it rolls it every day. Uh, there's also a separate file which logs the differences. That's a bit more verbose because a single comparison can have lots and lots of differences depending on, on what, what didn't match. Um, and then we say we want to report, we want to send it every day. And I, I just use send mail because my box has send mail set up and the email address to send it to. I'm sending it to my personal email address. You can also send an email there if you want. <laughs> um, so what have we discovered? I did running this for the past few couple of months, I did discover a few differences. Um, there was a TTL mismatch with one of our one of our servers that's been fixed. We also discovered that if you put a percent in a query, that broke the PowerDNS server. So uh, I don't know if we mentioned it. One of, one of our servers running PowerDNS. When we started the project, PowerDNS was not capable of running the root. Uh, an enthusiastic con community contributor actually modified it so it would run the root, um, and then he he ran the server himself. And this was considered a format error by the mm -hmm. server, which it's not, it was a bug. So they fixed it, and now it's running, running well. Um, and then finally, we have a problem right now, where if you do a look up for DS record, uh, Bundy now will return the additional section. And none of the other, none of the other authority servers will. We couldn't find any reference in an RFC that specifies that this is the required behavior, although someone did find the change in by nine to, to set this behavior. So it's intentional. Uh, I don't know. Um, Bundy is is the open source, the community based version of Bind 10. So there's not a lot of developers working on it, basically just me and my spare time, of which there isn't any. So I'll fix this at some point. It doesn't cause any problems, but it is a difference. So we do want to address it. Right. So I also collected the performance differences. This is a graph showing buckets of performance difference between IANA and Yeti. Now, this is the IPv4 interface at my house, and this is the IPv6, which is what Yeti is. Now, because it's over a tunnel, there's a little bit of extra, a little bit of extra delay in there. 
And this, you can see most of the queries are actually quite close. This is zero seconds, but there's this kind of, it's a bit high to even call it a tail of queries out to the right here. These queries are slower for Yeti than they are for IANA. Now to the left here, there are some queries that are faster to, to Yeti than they are to IANA, but on average, the difference is about 40 milliseconds, which is not insignificant. That's about 105% difference in the average response time. Yes? If your tunnel and point is you know, far away, then you get kind of right. so, triangle and all kind of you know, running that could explain yeah, a lot of yeah. it, So to, to be clear, I've like this implements an RTT algorithm. So it basically means that there is the, the power DNS server that's running is in Holland. So I, I, I live near Amsterdam. So for me, querying that server in, in Yeti is quite quick. There are at least four IANA servers that are also in Holland. So possibly what we're measuring here is just that as the RTT algorithm periodically tries other servers, it gets slower results. And that's what we're seeing here. So <laughs> indeed, if we compare the IPv6 interface, we see that the, the difference goes down from 40 to, to 24. So part of that is probably this tunnel, mm -hmm. tunnel cost. Mm -hmm. It may also be that IPv6 routing is less efficient for the, the IANA routes as well. Paul? Since you're in Europe, I recommend using the 6s.net v 6 tunnel instead of the hurricane. Talk to your red mess, sir. Which 6s? Which, which? S-I-X-X-S.net. Uh, I used to use 6ss.net. However, um, I would occasionally have problems where my tunnel would go down. And if and since I started configuring one of my resolvers to use Yeti, my tunnel going down left me with a bootstrapping problem. <laughs> so uh, with Hurricane Electric, you used to configure it by IP address, so there's no bootstrapping. With 6XS, they use a custom protocol, which breaks if you don't have DNS working. So layering violations are bad. Don't do them. I understand why they do it. They want to get through, through uh, NATs and things like that. But, um, so yeah, in the case of IPv6 versus IPv6, we have a much closer match, although there is still this long tail. And again, I, I think this is all just us probing the Yeti network, and we have, frankly, a lot of resolvers that are quite far away from my house. Um, so what does, that, what does that actually mean? In, in my case, for my home, Yeti is slower. Um, the IPv6 compared to IPv6 comparison is probably most interesting. As I said, it's not surprising. There's at least four IANA root servers at Amsterdam Internet Exchange. There may be more. It's hard to tell from the TTLs. There may be like an extra hop away or another rack or I don't know. Um, another thing is that the server selection algorithm has a, a huge impact on this. If if I was if I was change the parameters slightly about how often we try these other servers, mm. that could go. This tail here could go up or down. Mm. So if I, if I tried the server in Beijing only once a day, then it would be better than it is right now, or it probably tries it a bit more often. And if I tried it less often, because it's 350 milliseconds away, that would affect it a lot. So RTT selection has a huge impact here. Um, certainly, if other people wanted to do RTT comparisons, it could be quite interesting. My guess is that because I'm in probably one of the best connected places for internet in the world, It'd be very difficult for Yeti to provide a comparable performance. However, if you were in New Zealand or something, maybe you'd have a different picture of the whole thing. I don't know. Um, so for me, I think getting comparisons from more locations could be quite interesting. Another possibility is to run them, instead of doing it with the RTT algorithm, uh, select all for the servers that are selected. And then you could say, well, if Yeti could somehow magically pick the fastest in every case, how would it look? There's, there's many things that could be done. Anyway, in the end, this program should be very easy to run, and it can provide us traffic. So if you have access to queries that are going to a resolver, please consider using it. I'm happy to talk to you about how you can get that set up and everything. It, it should be quite straightforward. It does try to preserve privacy, so you don't have to worry about accidentally identifying users, even if you don't have QA minimization turned on. Um, and here is a link to a blog article I wrote about it which talks about all this stuff, but in even more detail. Right. 
That is it. So I'll be coming to each of you later today, begging you to run this program. <laughs> OK, so that's why I'm MVP. We also have a short talk about How would I make this full screen if I was able to read Chinese? There must be some shell crap. <coughs> five, two, F9. No, I need two. Control L, of course. So, another piece of software that we've written recently is Peak Out Parser. Now, I apologize if you're going to go to the IEPG tomorrow morning because I'm going to give this exact same talk there. So, but maybe you can sleep in. And <laughs> right now, state of the art for DNS traffic recording is Peak Out. Um, and historically, DNS software hasn't had a lot of facilities to record traffic. If your server was slow, of course, one of the first questions is, are you logging queries for some insane reason? If you are, please turn that off, and your server becomes 10 times faster. Um, usually, right now, traffic happens outside of the DNS software itself, either on the box with DNS cap or something like that, or maybe you do port mirroring or even weird optical splitting and things like that. Um, and this all works pretty well because the UDP pattern is quite simple. You send a packet, you get an answer. It's pretty easy to pull out of the data. Now, PCAP is, of course, not perfect. While usually in modern DNS, you still have a single packet query and a single answer response, right now, you can have TCP at any time. TCP has been elevated to equal to UDP in principle. There's no requirement that servers start with UDP, for example. And of course, TCP has always been used for zone transfers. So these days, with large messages, the responses become much less clean. And this is the reason we started looking at this in the context of the Eddy project. Because as Davey was talking about earlier, we have lots of big packets now. And what does that actually do to our traffic? It does fragment it. So the UDP layer, that means fragmented at the IP layer. So UDP just sends a single packet and expects the IP layer to do that, do that fragmentation. In TCP, um, it it may fragment, it may do IP fragmentation, but even if it doesn't do IP level fragmentation, there's always a stream of bytes where you have to kind of pull out the data somehow, which is not always, not always clear how to do that. So what do we do? Again, I get on the Go program, we take PCAP input, we write PCAP output. And it does two things. The first is that it defragments any IP packets that it finds that are fragmented. The second thing is it looks at the TCP stream and actually pulls out the data from that, and then it writes, unfragmented UDP IP packets. That's the whole thing. And the, the idea here is that when you're analyzing your data, you don't need to say, well, what do I do with these fragments? What do I do with this TCP? Because you're guaranteed that it's all something that your, your quite naive analysis programs can, can handle. It is DNS specific. Um, the, the reason for this is that what else are you going to do with TCP data? When we get TCP data, we have a two byte uh, length specifier in DNS. So we read that first, and then we read the packet after that. This works OK in DNS, because we know that the packets are going to fit in a single UDP uh, packet, no matter how big they are. Uh, but it doesn't work It doesn't work in a generic TCP. You know, someone could send a whole NetStream movie over a single TCP connection, and that doesn't make sense. So it's DNS specific. So first step, our first trick, defragmenting IP, basically it's pretty simple. We just collect all the little pieces that we get, and then we rebuild the original packet. The algorithms for IPv4 and IPv6 are basically the same. I didn't know how it worked until we did this project. It's actually kind of a crappy algorithm, because the receiver doesn't know how many packets it's going to get until you get the last one. I can see why it was done this way, because for a middle box, if a packet's too big, you just send what you have, and then read more data, and send what you have, and read more until you're done reading data, and then you send the last thing. So middle boxes don't have to maintain state. 
But it does mean that the end host does have to maintain the state, and it doesn't know how much it's going to have to maintain. Um, so, I, so what this means also is that all of your crappy middle boxes, which are trying to do uh, firewall type stuff, will often drop these on the floor, which is a source of much more pain and heartache because it's a crappy algorithm. So, grr. But nothing to be done about it now. Um, luckily for me and Moon Shaw, who's the developer who did most of this work, the, there's a, a library called Go Packet for the Go language, which actually implements this for IPv4. And because IPv6 is basically the same, we were able to implement that as well quite easily. Um, Runshot did this, and we're pushing it upstream, but we're not quite done pushing it because this is this library is managed by Google, and Google has some annoying, non-trivial intellectual property rights stuff. You have to sign things and give them a list of approved developers. I, I get it. Google doesn't want to be sued. Everyone wants to sue Google because they have lots of money. But from an open source point of view, it's kind of a pain in the ass. You just want to say, here's a patch, please apply it. And now, now that I'm on this list and watching this library, half of their patch submissions get rejected because they, someone says, here's a three line patch to fix this problem. And Google says, sure, here's a 40 page document, please sign that. And they say, go away, I don't want to do that. It's, I think it's, everyone loses, but. Isn't this the same with the Free Software Foundation? When you come, I, I, remember, I remember writing a, a very small patch for Emacs and yeah. I have to sign something to give copyright to the free software. Possibly. GNU, GNU may also be that way. I don't know. And for, for the exact same reason. Well, it's even worse for the FSF because Google can afford to be sued, but not the FSF. Yeah, who, would sue, who, would sue, who would sue Richard Stallman? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of crazy, crazy fascist would do that? Anyway, um, we're trying to do the right thing. We'll, we'll, we'll get this sorted out. Uh, we have all the paperwork ready. We just need um, so the other thing, our other trick is, is reassembling TCP streams. In principle, this could be really hard because TCP is a non-trivial protocol. Luckily, GoPacket also has TCP reassembly, so it's great. Um, so basically, we just inject this into the GoPacket TCP reassembly engine, and then it gives us what looks like a stream of bytes on the wire as if we had accepted a socket connection. And so we can just read our two-byte header, read the packet, and then write it out. So it's, it's quite, quite nice, actually, as a solution. Uh, oops. It's, um, so having said that, having this tool that is actually quite useful for us, that we can actually clean up our data and make it easy for us to post-process, I have a few thoughts about DNS logging in general. The first of which is that PCAP, as I started in the introduction, is not a great match. There's a lot of information that's duplicated and also unneeded. Um, even if you don't include the Ethernet headers, you know, you've still got IP headers, most of which that information you don't really care about or need. Um, and even in the DNS packet format itself, you end up with a lot of duplicated information. Every packet that you get is going to tell you that it's a internet uh, class. You know, like why why am I wasting my time? Anyway. Um, also, even though there's a lot of duplicated and unnecessary information, there is information that's missing. We don't have any way to match queries and answers other than like storing that and looking at history and things like that. We don't know anything about the internal state of any of the servers involved in this conversation. Um, there are attempts in the past to try to fix this. Uh, Robert Edmonds, I think, was leading this DNS tap effort, which I think is quite nice. I like the idea. Um, unfortunately, as far as I can tell, it doesn't define a file format. So it does. It does. It absolutely does. That's how we test it. It does define a file format. Yeah, we put this into count first, and we were making files all the time. Ah, OK. Ah, oh, OK, great. Well, I'll update the slides before tomorrow. Yeah, because I asked about it, and it's like, no, it's more of a protocol. And I was like, oh, I don't want a protocol. I want a file format. But OK, good. We okay. need both. OK, good, good. Um, also, there's been a lot of discussion lately about CBOR. I don't really know what that is. I need to read some drafts before Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, there was there was a, a short lightning talk at DNS OR from Terry Anderson and ICANN about some of the work that they've been doing, um, where, he, where he said that they were able to get files were about 25% as big as PCAP files with the same data, which seems quite excellent. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and also, one final thought is that someday in the, in the distant future, 
hopefully real soon, encryption will make all out of server logging worthless because all you're going to see is a bunch of ones and zeros. And you're not going to have any idea what's in it. So it's that that, that day is not yet, but someday that that's going to happen. Um, DNS tap was written for that day. Ah. So because it's meant to be collected from inside the server. Yes. And so it, that's it's an inside server yeah. solution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing when it comes to logging, especially query logging and stuff that you can't see when it's encrypted, is that today it's really, really popular to do lots of logging in the authoritative servers because you see all this stuff about what people ask about. With query minimization, that is going away. So at some point in the future, logging will really have to happen in the solar end rather than in the authoritative end. And that yeah. could be a massive shift also. Yeah. I agree. I yeah, I agree. It'll, it's honestly much more interesting on the, like everything in DNS is much more interesting on the resolver side. So, yeah. Um, anyway, that's it. There's a, like the other one, there's a blog article about this. All the, I guess all these slides will be up on our site. So there's a, there's a blog article and then a link to the source code. And we, of course, are happy to take patches without signing a contributor agreement. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We really like Kirby and your tools of uh, system. Yeah, thank you for your help. Okay, the next one is the Moritz from SLU to introduce Gimbal to this of the internet. And currently, we, uh, behind that, we use this open source tool to investigate what we connect. So, okay. Okay, hi. Uh, we are one of these guys who do uh, logging at the Forge of Nimso. And um, I come from the um, CCLD, TLD uh, of the LL. Uh, from SLM, we have uh, roughly 5.6 million domain names, which makes us one of the larger CCTLDs. And therefore, we also have uh, quite a lot of data. Um, so we see every single month roughly queries from uh, 3.1 million distinct resolvers, and that create 1.3 billion queries uh, every single day. That amounts to roughly 300 gigabytes of PCAP data daily. Um, and what my colleagues thought uh, three years ago, I think, um, that they they thought that there must be some additional value in this data um, in terms of operational insights, but also security insights. Um, and, but they hadn't had a tool to look at the data uh, in a more efficient way, to look at the large-scale amount of data into a fast uh, fast manner you could get PCAP files into Wireshark and uh, look at them manually, but that doesn't scale very well if you want to look at PCAP files over several months or years. So. Um, they started looking at different other solutions and they started with setting a bunch of requirements um, that this kind of platform should have. The first requirement was about SQL support. So we want to have our fellow research colleagues at SLAM to have access to the data uh, quite easily without having to learn another query language or yeah, uh, just to set the initial barrier quite low. We want to have it scalable. So in the beginning, we want to only store data for one single name server and uh, if um, this shows some value, then we want to scale it up. We want to have it high performance, so we want to have query responses within single, within seconds or minutes, if possible. Um, we want to have high capacity to store for a longer uh, period of time also DNS traffic um, in a more efficient form as well. We want to have it extensible, so we want to have built other tools on top of it, on top of the query that we uh, extract, but also have other tools to query the data. Um, we want to have it stable, of course, even though it was only a research cluster, but we want to make sure that we have complete data, because otherwise research is kind of uh, annoying if you miss data in between. So this also was um, one important requirement. And the last one was um, we didn't want to spend too much money because, yeah, it was a research project without knowing the actual value in the end. So, yeah, the initial cost should be quite low. So we looked at different kind of solutions. Um, 
really started looking at relational databases like Postgres, um, but that didn't scale very well. We looked at NoSQL databases, MongoDB, uh, Cassandra, but also we looked at Hadoop based um, solutions like Hadoop with uh, HBase, Phoenix, and Hive. And uh, we kind of ended at SQL on Hadoop, which is a platform developed by Cloudera and um, is based on Impala, which is the query engine with which you can get the data from the Hadoop cluster, and the Parquet file format, where you store the files in the end, and HDFS, which is the distributed file system. This evaluation was done three years ago, so now, of course, things change a lot, but um, this is we're still kind of happy with the solution that we have here. What would you, uh, what, what would you do different today? Um, uh, we have certain limitations. For example, we um, don't store all the answers that we send in our queries, so um, we don't have nesting. Um, this is something that, because I mean, on one side we have this data stored in other places as well, but it would be nice to have it all in one place. So um, there, for nested data, and Pala is not that great. Um, yeah, I think this is one, one of the things. Um, so this is roughly how this cluster would look like. So in the, uh, here you have three different nodes of a new cluster. At the bottom you have the distributed file system HDFS. On each different node there we have Parquet files, which are our actual query files, uh, or queries and responses that we saw there. And on top of that, on each single node there runs an Impala node, an Impala daemon. And this daemon manages the query. So if a user here on the left side has, uh, submits a query to the cluster, the query, for example, a simple query counting the number of uh, queries for every single level from the problem, then this query gets distributed uh, uh, over each node, uh, over, yeah, over each node, and then run on each node in parallel. And the result of this query is then sent back to one single node where the results are aggregated. This is the advantage that we don't have to send all the data to one single node where it's analyzed, but the analysis and the uh, it happens on every single node in parallel, which makes it quite efficient because it saves us a network IO. The folks from Cloudera also did some evaluation about the performance, and it performed quite well compared to other uh, engines, and this was also the reason why we chose it in the end. And one of the reasons why it runs so fast is because of the architecture. But I mean, this kind of slide later, sorry. Um, Impala, which is the query engine with which we access the data, supports this kind of performance. So we can also just store a simple plain text format on the cluster and access the data from there. We and it supports several Hadoop formats like Apache Avro and Apache Parquet. And which is also nice is it supports a bunch of different um, interfaces with which you can get the data from the cluster in the end. So you have a graphical user interface uh, where you can just like type in the query in an SQL-like statement and get the response back and you can also do some visualization there so already. You have command line interfaces um, and you have also um, different APIs for program languages, for Python for example, or for JDBC. And what I personally quite often do is I run Python script, I get the Python data, store this data into a, a pandas data frame and from there I analyze it further just to for data exploration, you know, if you want to name it like that. So I mentioned Apache PK as a uh, file storage, so we could store compressed PK files as well, but reading them is quite slow. And what Apache PK does is it's a column-based format, which makes it very efficient to read the data and also to uh, compress the data. So imagine that you have in the fields A, and you always have the query name, for example. Um, and in fields B, you always have the source, and in field C, you always have the query type, just as an example. And if you now, in Parquet, are interested in, for example, only the um, query name, then we can read in one row A1, A2, A3 without having to jump from one block to another, which makes it quite fast. And if we have the query type, um, C1, C2, C3, which are maybe all query types for Quad A records, then Parquet com can compress these quite efficiently because it doesn't have to store one uh, four times Quad A, but uh, can comp compress that. These Parquet files are then 
split it into blocks, and these blocks are then separated over each uh, node. So in the example before that, we had three nodes, now we have five different nodes, and by default, every block of the parquet file gets uh, duplicated three times. So we have a three times redundancy, and it gets spread over um, different nodes. You can manage on which kind of node the data is stored, but by default, it manages this on its own. And this has the advantage that if you run a query, if you run two parallel queries that both want to access the same data, then we can run the one first query on node A and the second query on node B, and we still have a quite high performance even though we run two parallel queries. And this is also all managed by the Impala uh, team, so we don't have to care about that anymore. So the stuff that I explained beforehand was all open source uh, components that uh, are, were already available. And what we basically did was the processing part from the main server, PCAP data, and uh, two storage into the cluster. And this is kind of the architecture we have there. So right now we have the name servers as sources. We have four of our, no, I think eight name servers um, currently attached to it. And in the middle part, we have the storage and in the end, also the, the access of the, the data. And on top of that, we can build applications and services. We also have a privacy framework to make sure that we don't store, for example, IP addresses for a very long time in order to comply with Dutch and EU regulations. So this is our cluster that we have right now. We have one management node that handles all the distribution of the queries. And we have six data nodes and two different locations. And um, we uh, had only four data nodes until the beginning of this year, but now we expanded and it was quite easy to expand that, uh, which was also nice. So it's it fills the requirements of being scalable. We can just add more data nodes and get more data into it. This is uh, the workflow that we have here. So in the beginning, uh, we have on each name server, we collect, collect the PCAP files, so on the box themselves. And every 10 minutes or so, we send these PCAP files onto the staging server. And this sending is done just through SAP. So yeah, it's quite a lot of load that we uh, handle there, uh, which is troublesome if you have a very, uh, even more load than we have on our on the name server. So for us, it's still manageable, but I can see that some people might have problems there. Then the PK file is decoded. The um, DNS query and DNS response are joined together. This also works if the response is in different PK file in the, in the query. We filter some data in which we're not interested in. We enrich the data. For example, we add the AS number of the source. We add the country of the source. We check whether the resolver was a Google resolver or an OpenDNS resolver, for example. We extract some metrics using uh, Graphite and Grafana. So we have kind of monitoring for the import of the data, but we, they also directly get some information about the queries that we get in a DSC-like uh, form, I would say. Um, and then we import the data into the cluster, where it's then first it's, it's uh, transformed to a parquet file, and then it's stored in the cluster. This process here in the middle is basically what we have to build for ourselves and which runs in parallel for every single name server. So as soon as we get data from one name server, this thing uh, gets triggered. And so in the end, we have roughly, after 10 minutes, the name server has received the query. We have the data on all the class, and we can analyze it. Is there, any, is there any reason to not run multiple staging servers? Are there any single points? Or... Um, you could do that, it's true. Um, no, I think right now, because we it's, it's fast enough for it's us. It's fast enough, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, but yeah, it shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Anymore. So in terms of performance, it performs quite well. So this is a very, very simple query. And this performance also really depends on the type of query that you're writing. But in this case, we count the number of queries for one day, one month, and one year. And if we run it for one month, it's finished in less than two or three minutes, uh, which uh, and in one year it's finished in less than 20 minutes, uh, which amounts to roughly 2.2 terabytes of PK files or 52 terabytes of PK files. We can also start this thread uh, 10 times. So for example, for the query for one month, we would start one single thread for every single day. So we uh, count the number of queries for a single day. 
start 10 threads and then in the end aggregate the results and then the performance uh, is getting even better. Now storing the data is great, but we also want to have some use cases. Um, these are the use cases that we see at the uh, CCTOD level. So we do some visualization of the uh, DNS traffic. We also publish this data on the statistics website. We do some scientific research. Um, we do support for the operators. So for example, we had a look at what happened when we published our zone file not every two hours, but every one hour. So what kind of uh, behavior have we seen there? And we do some more security related stuff, real time phishing detection and detection of uh, botnets, of or one specific botnet, so I have to um, be precise. And I want to talk about the last two briefly. So the malicious domain detection uh, works as follows we detect domains which are newly registered and are then used for phishing, for example. And what we have observed, but also other researchers have observed already, is that. Domain names that are registered for only the purpose of phishing, they get way more DNS queries at the first days than regular uh, queries. And then we see here in the graphs, basically. So on the left side, we see quite slow growth of queries, and on the uh, right side, we see uh, a very high load of queries, which then decreases uh, after a few days. And what we do is, every single day, we check which kind of new domain names were registered. We collect all the information from our internal yeah, clusters, so the number of queries, the number of distinct resolvers, the number of uh, distinct countries where the queries came from, and the number of distinct AS. And then we use a simple k means clustering algorithm to cluster these two domain names, which gives us then two clusters. One is a cluster of, we think, legitimate domain names, and one cluster of suspicious domain names. And what we're currently doing is we run a prototype with six registers, I think, and as soon as we see a domain name which we think is suspicious, then, and this domain name is registered at one of these registers, then we inform this register about it, and the register can then have a more closer look if this suspicion was actually true or not, and then take actions, for example, take the domain name down. The second project um, started from the goal to have some kind of resolve reputation to get more information about different kind of resolves, and then we detected one very specific fingerprint of one resolver, which was of an apocalypse client. So usually if we have apocalypse clients, they're behind recursive resolvers, so we don't see that tra traffic directly. Um, but in this case, it was the cutware botnet client. It is used for distributing spam uh, mails, and it's uh, implementing their own resolver. And this resolver has some quirks, for example, is, yeah, just uses a weird set of uh, query IDs and weird set of uh, uh, ports and also sends some queries to your own name servers which are not for now, so some very weird stuff. And this is why we can detect these kind of infected clients quite um, efficiently and with a very high accuracy. And um, therefore we also share this data with some of Dutch ISPs, so if they um, we detect a client which is infected in their uh, networks, then they can take actions based on that. However, the infection may decrease quite a lot, or even though it varies a lot, but in the last month it decreased quite a lot. So, uh, conclusion, um, yeah, we are quite happy with what we have here. Uh, it's been for over two years now, and um, yeah, we're planning to add more name servers now. We want to develop more applications on top of it, because yeah, this is actually what we uh, have it for, and we want to increase the number of internal users. So uh, the BIA uh, has tested it already. We have some other registrars who are playing with it, uh, and it's open source. You can check it out on the website. Uh, we are always happy to hear some feedback. Uh, if you have some um, some stuff that you want to fix, then also let us know. And you also can contact us if you have any trouble with setting up the, the cluster. We have to help you. Um, and that's basically it. Thank you. Thanks. Well, it's an interesting uh, presentation. Uh, two questions with potential to see information. Uh, how much data are you adding to your Hadoop database? Do you use that mostly every day? Every day? I think it's like maybe 20, 20 gigabytes of data, roughly, but probably a bit more. And you get any instrumentation about how, that, how the performance of doing your lookups across that Hadoop database 
cost are going to go as the size of the data set increases? No, we haven't looked at that, but we have the feeling that it's going slower. That's just the rough feeling from the daily usage, but we haven't measured it. But yeah. So I think it would make sense to add maybe additional uh, nodes there to distribute that. Uh, the data a bit further. So the gut feel is it going to be linearly with the size of the data? Well, this is not sufficient to report, so. Doesn't take me long. Yeah, I have a question. When I, uh, when my team used the, the tool to run, because we right now we only have one node, so uh, we have more than one gigabit data, and both the assorted side and we have some recursive server. So, uh, what's the minimal requirement for the requirement of the machine? I, I mean, the single node, because sometimes the HUE we use sometimes data. Base locked uh, usually happen, and also uh, the, the the machine we use to to to, to parse the data sometimes get very slow, and we need to reboot again. Yeah. We so any requirement on the hardware, and also is there any, any operational suggestion? If yeah, I think originally they kind of claimed that new clusters could run on a very low scale hardware, but in the end they just like adapted to what was there. And uh, so final rerun, I think, I can't tell you the specifics right now. I think we have uh, Xeon CPUs with 2.4 gigahertz. I have to look that up, so I, I can't. Oh, okay, we can uh, yeah. smell to exchange the yeah. information. So not a Raspberry Pi. Not a Raspberry Pi, unfortunately. Otherwise we add tons of notes. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you, Morris. Thank you for your presentation. Okay. The last session is uh, open session, and I heard from Paul, he said he wants to deliver another slice, and I want to host the last session. section. So, uh, do, have you, have you seen me have you the slides? Yes, okay. Let me check. You have the coordinators. Okay. Which one? There are two. Oh, no, no, that's the first one. Probably the one that says it's the second set. Uh, it's the right. second set. Okay. Oh, in my current that's condition, I may have got that back. Does that okay. not work? <laughs> okay. All right, so if I start making word salad, it's an indication of jet lag, some of these blade your arms. Um, all right, in uh, 2005, I made a proposal, which was to have ICANN create several different root zones that have different metadata for the same namespace. Um, and, uh, you know, when I talk about the third rail of internet governance being the root name, uh, the root zone, root name server system. I want to say that the third rail is, you know, it's electrified. It will kill you if you touch it. But in 2005, I actually put my tongue on that rail to make sure that I got good and crispy when, it, when I was electrocuted. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I didn't give up. Uh, unlikely to. Um, so let me tell you what I know. Um, even if you are in the same country, same region, the same campus, whatever, uh, with a resource on the internet, um, if you lose your connectivity to assets outside of that region or that country or that, that campus, chances are you will not be able to find the things that are inside the perimeter with you. They're reachable at packet levels, but you can't resolve their names, and so it doesn't matter how reachable they might be. Um, this is a problem that was solved well by the enterprise class networks that preceded the uh, internet. For example, Apple Talk got this right. Um, XNS got this right. Um, even some early Microsoft uh, naming systems got this right. You know, if you could reach the thing, you could also resolve its name. Um, but none of those things were going to scale to the size of the global internet, and so they failed in the market. But we probably need to fight our way back to those times. It would be really good if you're on some island somewhere and some 
uh, ship drags its anchor across your your trans-Pacific cable, transatlantic cable, <coughs> that um, you can still reach, you know, the mail server at your ISP. Right now you can't, unless there are name servers for all of the different layers of the DNS hierarchy between you and it, including a root server. Now at Fruit, we put root servers in places that made no economic sense. Fiji has one, for example. Um, but that's unlikely to happen. Now, um, it turns out that one of the things that is most important uh, is not the positive answers, but the negative ones. Because the positive ones are more likely to be cached. Uh, but there are plenty of people, browsers, uh, following various website uh, content, or uh, B2B, machine to machine, back office type tasks for which a negative response from the DNS is necessary to allow work to continue. You might have some inner loop somewhere whose total performance is going to be limited by its DNS, and a lot of the DNS it needs to keep going is negative answers. Um, we, we tend to emphasize too much the delegations that you're getting from the roots and not enough the negative responses that are coming from the roots. Um, <clears throat> So these, uh, the IANA root servers are massively over-provisioned. They have to be because they are DDoS targets. They're very sexy DDoS targets. If you sell DDoS as a service, um, you will often be called upon by a potential client to DDoS something that will make the newspapers uh, so that you can prove that you can actually do what they're going to ask you to do because they don't want their attack to be you know, the attack they're paying you for to be trivially uh, rebuffed by their intended victim. And DDoSing the roots is a very you know, good way to prove your capabilities. Uh, so anyway, the IANA observers are, are I think, all, all using Anycast at various layers. Uh, some of them have 100 cities, some of them have 10, none of them has fewer than two. Um, and that makes them pretty hard to DDoS. Uh, unless it's this year. <laughs> so um, DDoS risk that comes from IP spoofing uh, has, has grown every year. Uh, as important as BCP38 was, and my own uh, follow-on work, which of course rests on and refers to BCP38, was uh, SAC 004, it was all published in the last century, uh, or the very beginning of this century. And um, <clears throat> nothing has changed except that as the internet has grown, the new parts of the internet generally don't enforce uh, source address validation either. Uh, so the problem has gotten nothing but worse, even though everyone in the business knows that it's a problem. Uh, but the economics of solving it are still uh, completely asymmetric, and so it's not going to get solved. But this year, uh, we've now seen a couple of very big attacks coming from IoT devices. Um, the one that hit Krebs was measured at 620 gigabits per second, uh, and that was just coming from some low-end uh, baby monitors and um, closed-circuit TV cameras. Uh, IoT does not lend itself to quality. Uh, it is very much a, uh, a consumer retail market where your total success and your total revenue is going to be driven more by your time to market than by any other single fact. Um, maybe your feature level and price will enter into it, but certainly not your quality or your safety. There's not going to be any red teaming. And the companies that are going into the IoT business are not going to say, oh, by the way, now I'm a software company. Now I need to learn what a CERT is and what a CERT advisory is and how to participate in that process. They're not going to do that. They're going to say, we should play bulbs. Um, the source code to IoT devices is usually not saved. Uh, once you ship, it doesn't matter. So, um, anyway, this year, it is now possible to DDoS pretty much anybody. When Google, who has a program for protecting uh, people, reporters and other people who are likely DDoS targets, uh, decided to accept Brian Krebs after Akamai said that uh, they didn't want Brian Krebs anymore, uh, we were all wondering whether Google was going to have their name in the papers for not being reachable to some portion of their customers. Uh, it turned out that they were bigger than the size of the botnet that day. Uh, 
if that continues to be true, it'll be because Google plows a huge amount of money into more capacity, uh, and they will have to grow faster than the IoT. I think we all know where that race ends, which is that Google is not going to be at the finish line before the IoT. Anyway, um, adding more root letters is going to add complexity, right? The um, there are certainly recursive name servers out there that will um, just try a root or whatever is the one that comes up first in the rotation and keep trying a root until it doesn't answer and then move to B. But that's not the usual thing. The usual thing is what BIND does, which is to measure the RTT to all the different addresses, um, always choosing the lowest one, which means they all start at zero so they all get a chance. But you will eventually decay out the one that you've been using and it'll fall out and you'll, you know, do some more probing and so forth. You'll deal with the gradual revisions in uh, BGP connectivity uh, and always end up with good service. I like the bind algorithm. Um, I think the bind 9 is much better than the bind 8 one as far as that goes. But the fact is, every one of those probes is an opportunity to have a timeout. Because if BGP is currently taking your packets off the rails and down into a canyon somewhere, uh, you're going to discover that after some number of seconds and try the next server. But that delay is going to be reflected at the application layer for somebody. They're going to see a delay while you're doing that. Now, if we have more than 13 servers with um, more than 25 or so addresses, then we're adding more opportunities for that type of failure to happen. And so, politically speaking, it is uh, suicide to tell the root operators that 13 is too many and that five would be a better number. The eight of you just need to take a suicide pill now. That won't happen. And nobody will even ask, because if they ask, the answer will be, well, I'm not going to do it, and the others aren't going to do it, so to hell with you. Uh, but in fact, 13, in my opinion, is already too much complexity, given the number of people, number of devices, number of links, amount of BGP churn, and so forth. And so trying to add another 10 or 20 in order to satisfy all the countries who wish that they, too, could have a root server letter of their own, instead of just any cast instances in the current system, uh, would take a bad situation and make it worse. That's not politically infeasible, uh, but it is uh, still unwise, technically, in my opinion, unwise. So Kamari and Hoffman produced an RFC where you run a local root server on your loopback, um, and they made it work with bind, and they made it work with unbound, and so forth. Uh, I don't think that can scale to internet size. I'll tell you why in a moment. Uh, the two goals we ought to have is first to reduce the critical load on the global root name server system so that they don't have to provision infinite capacity to deal with IoT attacks or a blended IoT plus IP spoofed attack. Um, and the second is to reduce our dependency on them so that when there is an attack that is successful against some letter, it's not service affecting. Um, and um, Nothing right now that is in the mix is going to do that. Uh, we, we need to solve a number of other problems that could include this one, but there's nobody really pushing on this particular uh, piece of the puzzle right now, except me. So as they say on uh, PBS radio, let's do the numbers. Uh, we have around 5 billion end users. Uh, we have around 50 million RDNS servers, maybe 30 million. Most of them are accidental. These are uh, home DSL gateways that are offering recursive DNS on their WAN side that shouldn't be, but they're like IoT devices. The companies who made them didn't save the source codes. So they're not really going to be patched anytime soon. Um, and like a cheap $4 Mickey Mouse watch that you bought from maybe in a drugstore somewhere, it's going to last longer than anything that was more expensive. These things that are made of cheap plastic tend to, uh, to the last generations. So those uh, servers aren't going away, but if they did, we'd still wind up with around 5 million recursive DNS servers that are actually needed. They're actually intentionally created and operated by somebody who knows they're operating one. Um, and they divide up, right? The, that's not 5 million independent servers. A lot of those are parts of clouds where you're uh, you're dealing with 10 or 100 or 500 recursive servers across an enterprise. 
or across an ISP or certainly uh, Google DNS with its 8.8.8.8 thing. Uh, it's obviously got hundreds or thousands of servers because it's, uh, you know, it works, it's really fast no matter where you are. Um, but um, the difference between 10 to the 7th and 10 to the 5th is a factor of 100, and that is roughly the uh, difference in complexity between the Kumari Hoffman proposal and uh, my original 2005 proposal. Um, because if every single RDNS server has to be able to do its own transfer from the root service, and I know I can't operate some dedicated service for this, um, that's a lot of zone transfer traffic. And um, that's a lot of configuration management, a lot of monitoring. That's uh, it's a fair amount more complexity even than RFC 5011 uh, trust anchor chasing. Uh, I would much rather solve that problem for 10 to the 5th than for 10 to the 7th. And here's how I recommend doing it. Uh, this was the proposal I made. Um, and I'll just say that uh, you, you guys all know that what any cast is. But to be hierarchical in this case means that as you get further from your laptop and closer to the internet core, you are reaching larger connectivity realms. You start with your host, you go up through a LAN, campus, ISP, metro area, country, region, and finally the global system. And uh, the way that worked in AS112, we needed name servers for 10.inadder.arpa, so that all the PTR requests that people were leaking there would not hit the real root servers, we wanted to drain them off somewhere. And we do that by uh, hierarchical anycast. There are some global AS112 nodes, there are some regional ones, there are some LAN ones, some ISP ones. And basically, it just means that every time you get closer to the core, you're in a larger concentric circle of connectivity, and there's an opportunity at that circle crossing for somebody to say, hey, you're sending a packet to a distinguished address that I am going to handle locally rather than following the default route further up. Um, and um, AS112 is a very uh, special kind of hierarchical anycast. I mean, effort uses uh, hierarchical anycast also. There are some global nodes and local nodes and so on. But uh, AS112 uses unowned hierarchical anycast. And by that, I mean that the addresses were not in one person's name. The addresses were fished out of a drawer somewhere and ended up with hard-coded who is information. And there's not really a registrant, per se. Um, this was something I did by accident by asking Ray Polzak if he could, you know, cough up some address space and a, a low numbered AS for me, and he did. It turned out that he broke every rule Aaron had, but that the CEO was empowered to do that. Uh, that's not true anymore. Um, so uh, we can't do that again. Um, and it turns out it's, it's even harder than that. Um, so. I gave a presentation earlier this afternoon on this topic. Um, let me just briefly recap it for you. Uh, a root zone contains some metadata, like the Apex signatures, or excuse me, Apex keys and name servers and, thing, and all the signatures, and then namespace data, the non-Apex NS and DS records that actually give rise to the TLDs. Um, and it's important when thinking about all of this and deciding whether the third rail really is electrified uh, to say that as long as you're serving the same namespace, you're you're sort of in the in the ballpark for the ICAMP slogan of one world, one internet. Um, it's and you know if you have to modify the zone that, that represents that namespace to have different metadata, as let's say Yeti does, that doesn't mean you're a namespace pirate. That doesn't mean you're an alternate root bozo. That doesn't mean you're trying to break the system. Uh, I mean, it could, but it doesn't in the case of Yeti, and it need not in other cases. Uh, so you have to distinguish between the namespace and the zone. Um, the difference is the metadata. So um, what we do in our various cron jobs in the Yeti project, uh, where we fetch from the IANA validated signatures, strip those signatures, replace the DNS key and the NS records, and sign with our own local key and then notify and transfer to some secondaries. Uh, that is relatively easy. And yeah, it took us a year to get it right, but that was because it wasn't our day job. Um, and, and we did ultimately get it right. 
Um, and participating recursive operators just have to replace their root hints file to point at our addresses and names and replace their trust anchor to include one of ours and then they would continue as before. They would get the same namespace information, they would just be getting it from a different place and the signatures would be validated by a different key. And the key word really is participating recursive operators. This is not something that you can do uh, without permission from the recursives. The only way you could do this without having the uh, recursives deliberately choose to participate is if you were to pirate the addresses of existing root servers. Um, they actually do that in, in China inside the CERNET2 network. Uh, Fruit receives no queries from them because they answer 192.5.5.241 locally. And I asked them, why are you doing this and would you please stop? And they said, it's our network, it's our rules. It doesn't matter that it's your destination address, it's our network. Okay, great, I hope that doesn't <laughs> catch on. Um, hijack. But uh, this is not a hijack. This represents a way that cooperating authority and recursive operators can get the IANA namespace without talking to the IANA servers. And where I'm going with this is that you can do that at any layer of the hierarchy. So here's what won't work. Um, if, the, if we could get the IAB to make an exception to their statement about distinguished addresses, they have said that distinguished addresses is bad design and that you shouldn't have to you know, use a particular address in order to get some service. You should use a service discovery method. But if we could get them to say, well, except for this one case, or maybe two, we could get them to uh, back in the AS112 addresses as well. Uh, if we could get IANA to allocate a couple of slash 48 prefixes out of V6 and a new, new style 32-bit ASM uh, so that we could get unowned hierarchical anycast, just like we have with AS112. And by the way, I wouldn't propose trying to do this on V4. V4 is not quite dead, but we should treat it as if it was dead. There's no reason to, to bother with V4 on this. And if we could then get ICANN to publish a second root name zone, uh, root zone, same namespace, always the same namespace, but they would be able to use the key they already have that everybody already trusts. So we wouldn't have to change the RFC 5011 uh, trust anchor at all. Uh, but it would have different Apex NS metadata. It would be identical to the, uh, the current root zone in every way except that uh, root Apex metadata would be different because it would point at these new hierarchical unknown anycast servers. We can easily assume that the 12 existing root operators would all say, yep, I will serve that in addition to my legacy address because that's what root ops do, they serve. Um, and that would be the global last resort set of these prefixes so that if nobody closer to you in the hierarchy, like in your campus or in your region or in your country, captured packets to this destination, it would end up going to the same operators that we have now. Um, but uh, chances are good that they would. Chances are good that uh, certainly in, uh, what is it, uh, BRIC, B-R-I-C, Brazil, Brazil, Russia, India, China uh, would probably all decide that they wanted to do this as part of some federal networking service. Uh, which is their right, right? We, the internet doesn't get to tell countries uh, jack, right? Uh, so the, the national sovereignty can change just because we stuck a uh, thick wire ethernet cable across the border. Um, but ISPs could do it. I mean, we saw that there was a lot of people adding AS112 servers because it cut down on their transit bill and it also meant that they were less dependent on outside resources. Uh, but this, again, is infeasible. Uh, the IAB, IANA, and ICANN are not going to do what is shown here. Uh, at least, I don't think it'll happen in my lifetime. Those first four bullets? Oh. Other than that, it's pretty good. <laughs> oh, oh, why? Um, why well, they wanted to cite an RFC, so this IAB member can assess what you're saying. <laughs> I, I, I will find it for you. I'd appreciate that. Or you can just ask Bill because he's the one who quoted it to me. That doesn't actually help me very much. Yes, I know. Um, so I don't think this is going to happen. 
Uh, I'll push for it. I will never stop pushing for it because I think it's the right thing to do. But I'm, I got to be realistic. Um, oh, Paul, so one question: Why, why, why is it politically? You no, know, you described a very nice proposal here. Yeah. So why is it politically infeasible? Why won't you adopt it? Because anybody who thought that they should say yes to this would be worried about the hundred people that would clamor at their door for why are they giving away the internet, or why are they. Yeah, it would be the same kind of Ted Cruz insanity that we saw just before the IANA transition. So, if you touch the root zone, you die. That's the rule. <laughs> to be honest, you don't have to get those addresses in ASN from IANA. I, I'm sure some RIR could be convinced somehow. The IAB statement, while nice, it's not strictly necessary, right? We already have AS112, which, right? And I don't, I think the root ops, they're committed to carrying the zone that's published. So maybe that's not impossible either. That ICANN one is tricky. Getting an ICANN to sign anything else with this same key that all the people go down into the bunker they to. have to, to revisit a lot of that process, yeah. I don't see them doing that. No, I don't either. Okay. I want it to happen. I'm going to keep trying to work the issue. I'm just telling you. Um, yeah. This did not get less hopeless at any recent time. Um, it was considered a uh, this was considered a radically bad idea in 2005, and uh, I believe it's the same now. So um, let's talk more about this at the next break because uh, I'd like to get to more general discussion. This is what I'm actually thinking we're going to be able to do, which is that on your own host uh, or a virtual LAN, if you're running some sort of virtualization thing and you have 10 Linux boxes inside your laptop or a real LAN or a campus like your house or an ISP, country, region, you'll take some addresses that are already yours in some way. You've already had them allocated. They are, they're inside your routing uh, horizon. Um, for example, on my laptop, it would be probably net 10 somewhere. I think that's what I'm using for virtual box. Um, in an ISP, they've got address space and so forth. So this would just be a, a sort of a normal IGP level anycast rather than a global or BGP level anycast. Uh, you generate one of these localized root zones the same way we do it with Yeti. Um, and if your uh, routability horizon, if the, if the size of the network you intend to propagate this over is bigger than a LAN, you might want to do as we do with Yeti and have a distribution master that runs the cron job that fetches it and signs it and all that crud and then pushes it to some uh, public secondary servers that actually perform the, the, the act of providing answers. Um, and the recursive operators who want to participate can just change their hints and trust anchors to point at this and those who don't will just pass like ships in the night. They'll still reach the existing infrastructure. So uh, again, nothing is being hijacked. There's no unilateralism here. Um, and uh, this fulfills goal one and goal two from a couple of slides ago. And it will scale to the number of RDNS operators in the world. Uh, it would not scale to the number of RDNS servers in the world. Yes, sir. So how is this different than the proposal to run a root zone on loopback? Root zone on loopback requires you to do it on every recursive server that you wish to have participate. This is done on any cloud of such servers. In other words, you could do this once inside of, I don't know, UUNet, and tell UUNet's customers, by the way, we have a local instance of the IANA namespace, change your hints files if you want all of your root traffic to stay on our network instead okay. of crossing. It scales well because I get it. it's a network service, so you could add more instances and it's completely. Now, this is more dangerous than having IANA do it um, because it is possible to add a step so that instead of taking the existing namespace and stripping off metadata and replacing it, you also.